Council to order on December 5th, 2023. City Clerk, roll call, please. Mayor Schlachter. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Barr. Here. Council Member Driscoll. Here. Council Member Grove. Here. Council Member Peters. Here. Council Member Ryden. Here. Council Member Reichart. Here. We have a quorum. All right. Thanks. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, next up is approval of the agenda. Council has had a chance to review the agenda. There is one small change to the agenda due to an illness. Item 9A uh, is going to have to be rescheduled. And if there's any other changes, no any changes. So without uh, objection, we will approve the agenda as uh, amended there. Um, item 4, uh, new with the new council here, we're kind of switching the order of comments uh, going on. So we're going to have public comment come first here. Uh, so public comment is a time for community members to come express opinions regarding issues that are not part of public hearings on tonight's agenda. A uh, separate opportunity will be provided uh, for any public comment for that public hearing. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. Uh, when you get to the three minutes, I will let you know you've hit your time. We expect comments to be civil, disrespectful, or disruptive behavior will not be tolerated. Council is not authorized under open meeting laws to take action at this meeting on any issue raised by public comment that is not part of tonight's agenda. I may refer matters to city manager or attorney for further uh, information. And so we'll have, when they're done signing up, we'll have the list of signups. I will just say, as we have a lot of people in the audience tonight and the list looks long, I will uh, let people know who's going to speak and then let the next person on deck so you can be ready, so you can kind of get up and be prepared for that. All right, first up on the list, we have Josh Stewart, followed by Jonathan Slater. Hello. My name is Josh Stewart. I live one quarter mile east of Runyon Elementary School, one mile south of Euclid Middle School, and a half mile east of Heritage High School. I am the father of Liam Stewart. I know that there is nothing any city council member can do to change what happened to my son. But I hope what happened to my son can change the hearts and minds of each person on city council. Today, I am asking that you each take the first step to change your perspective about our city. Five years ago, city council adopted a transportation plan for our neighborhoods their thinking was not best for our citizens, and I ask you to think differently. Back then, they may have thought, kids just don't play outside anymore. I ask you now to think, why are people scared to play in their own yards? Back then, they thought, how can we move more cars through our city? I ask you to think, how do we protect our neighborhoods from more cars? Back then, pedestrians were imagined as fully grown, able-bodied adults. Now, when you think of a pedestrian, I ask you to imagine a father pushing his infant in a stroller to the park, a veteran in a wheelchair on her way to the store, a grandfather in a mobility scooter on their way to lunch with family. Back then, bicyclists were seen as adults in spandex, with clip-in shoes on an $8,000 bike. I ask you now, when you think of a bicyclist, 
imagine my son, Liam, making his way to school, pedaling a bike he is still growing into, a bike that he bought with his own allowance. Thank you. Thank you for coming down tonight, Josh. Next up, Jonathan Slater, followed by David Morrison. Good evening, council and staff. I'm Jonathan Slater. I moved to Littleton in 2013. I live in District 3 near Euclid Middle School. I'm an LPS parent. My family walks, bikes, RTD, and occasionally drives a car to get around. First, I'd like to address the comment made at last Tuesday's study session, suggesting a focus on prompting safer street design with the consideration of the way people move safely with the neighborhood implies a disregard for the safety of motors. To imply that a pedestrian biking community wants to force a mother of six or anyone else to, drive, to ride a bike is a divisive and irresponsible comment. Our intention is not to mandate particular means of transport for anyone. We advocate the safety for everyone on our streets through safe street designs, cars included. The prioritization of walking, rolling, and biking stems from a recognition of vulnerability of these users when sharing the road with larger vehicles. It's important to understand that neighborhood streets are already designed for cars. They're not designed for walking and rolling and biking. We all want to get from point A to B safely regardless of the mode of transport we choose. Secondly, I encourage the discussion of lowering speed limits to 20 miles per hour. I understand the concern that some drivers may exceed the limit, but this shouldn't dissuade us from acting. Speeding is a known issue in our neighborhoods. Lowering and posting a consistent speed limit is a practical first step in saving lives and setting a precedent that we are a community that values human life over speed and convenience. However, it's important to emphasize that the solution alone will not make our streets safe. It is an initial step that must be accompanied by safe street design. Lastly, I want to urge this council to adequately fund the Department of Public Works. I also encourage DPW to commit to prioritizing safety, street design, and all their street projects. Prioritizing safety standards, placing pedestrians at top, followed by cyclists, and then automobiles. By addressing these points, we, one, acknowledge the importance of safety for all road users. We adequately fund DPW, prioritizing safe street design and setting a precedent for slower speeds in our neighborhoods. I would like to extend an invitation to the members of this city council and this staff to walk around our community and witness firsthand the issues and challenges we all face walking, rolling, and biking in our community. I would be more, ha be more than happy to accompany you and share my observations and discussions about the issues around our neighborhoods. I thank you for your time and consideration. Good night. Thank you. Next up is David Morrison, followed by Maria Mant. Uh, sorry, I will not be speaking to you. Okay. Maria Mant is up, followed by Phil McCart. Good evening. My name is Maria Mant, and I live in District 3. While new to these meetings, I am not new to the impact of motor vehicle speed on injury patterns and mortality rates in, in pedestrian and bike victims. As a pediatric emergency medicine doctor at Children's Hospital Colorado, I have spent the last 15 years picking up the pieces for children and their families who are impacted by speed-related vehicular accidents. The anatomy of the pediatric patient is different. Kids' vital organs have less protections, their ribs break easier, and their skulls crush with less force. All of these physical developmental differences result in more severe and widespread injuries in children compared to adults when hit with the same force. A child hit by a vehicle traveling under 20 miles per hour looks very different. <laughs> It, then a trauma, then uh, very different in my trauma bay than one hit at speeds over 20 miles per hour. Slowing traffic down through, through slower speed limits, intelligent road designs and barriers, and narrowed streets has been shown to reduce mortality rates. I am a mother 
who walks my child to Euclid Middle School every day and sees cars entering the bike lane as they speed around the roundabout trying to beat the car coming from the opposite direction. I have cringed as cars hit the brakes when a child comes suddenly into view, narrowly escaping an accident. And I have physically pulled my child back as a car speeds down a lottie and drifts across the painted line of the bike lane. Lastly, I am the bystander who gave CPR to Liam for eight minutes before EMS arrived. I, along with my 12-year-old son, watched Liam be hit and dragged by the vehicle that killed him. Liam was following all of the rules. He was in the bike lane. He was simply biking to school in an unprotected bike lane. I have to deal with the aftermath of the impact this has had on myself as a physician, as a mother, the impact it's had on my son, who was a friend to Liam, and my neighbors. I am angered by a pediatric emergency medicine physician and a mother that so much is left to chance for our kids and for our community. Rather than our city employing the Vision Zero efforts embraced by so many other communities, it is a basic right for all of our citizens to be safe during their daily commute, not just the adult, able-bodied, experienced rider who feels perfectly safe biking recreationally during their downtime, but to keep our children safe, Thank you, Ms. our senior community members safe, and our bike commuters safe. Thank I urge you, Maria, you to reconsider the 2024 Thank budget. Thank you. Thank you. Phil McCart, followed by Patrick Santana. Hi, my name is Phil McCart. I live in District 3. I'm a Littleton father to this 10-year-old girl, 10-month. <laughs> At last week's study session on bicycle and pedestrian safety, this council had a rare and op and <clears throat> a rare opportunity to present a united front and take bold action in the wake of now multiple pedestrian killings on Littleton's streets that were not designed for safety. That unfortunately did not happen. The Department of Public Works now has unclear direction and any member of the city staff can pick and choose which priority from council they choose to follow. Is it optimizing speed and car capacity? Is enforcement the only mechanism to rely on slowing down drivers? Is it punishing pedestrians and cyclists for not using crosswalks? I'm asking council tonight to embrace a bold vision to immediately prioritize safety and vastly increase the livability of Littleton in the future. You don't need to wait until master plans are updated while it's always preferred to hear from citizens first, there are times where action is more important, and this is one of those times. The data is very clear. The only 24-7, 365 days a year way to guarantee reduced risks to all road users, including automobiles, is to build safe streets, period. There are no other reasonable options. I want a future for Littleton where I don't need a seven-seat SUV to drive a mile to the grocery store without fearing for my life. I want a future for Littleton where my young daughter will feel safe riding her bicycle to school. I want a future for Littleton where kids, families, singles, and the elderly gather organically and spontaneously downtown where my teenage daughter is not trapped inside alone waiting to get her first car where kids of all ages enjoy our beautiful climate outdoors without worry of being ran over. I want a future where my family can go on a walk down Prince Street without a giant truck blowing past me at 45 miles an hour. You know, we know, and I know 
The most credible path to a livable, accessible Littleton of the future is investing now in fundamentally altering our streetscapes for the next chapter in our city's history. Please take action before any potential listening session and please ensure any listening session is focused on safety and not just a pointless cars versus bicycle culture war. Complete waste of time. If you like this vision of a livable Littleton where safety is our number one guiding principle, please join Vibrant Littleton. There are a lot of us in the audience tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCart. Uh, next up, Patrick Santana followed by Todd um, Schollenberger. My name is Patrick Santana. I live on Kaylee Place. I'm an active member of the city's planning commission and Vibrant Littleton. During last week's bike and ped study session, as Phil mentioned, there was a proposal for a listening session. I'd like to offer three thoughts and call attention to some pitfalls, especially to Jim and our city staff. First, it's imperative that this listening session be properly named and framed. Street safety, first and foremost, is the issue we're grappling with in the wake of Liam Stewart's death and Preston Dunn's killing on, this, on our roadways. Any listening session needs to be centered on safety, not on transportation or some other broad, ill-defined mobility topic. Using the event's name to set a focus, a title like a community conversation on street safety, safe for streets, is essential to making that a success. If we fail to name and frame it specifically around street safety, then such a gathering will devolve into other topics that don't involve safer streets. You'll, as Phil mentioned, you'll end up with another big argument between people who ride bikes and people who don't like bikes. It, it, it's a, a waste of time for both citizens and the city. Second, we miss a lot of key voices at these kind of events. The people most impacted by dangerous streets are the least likely to be at a listening session. The eight-year-old who just wants to safely ride to the library, she won't be there. An 85-year-old who struggles with a walker to get across Windermere, he's not going to be there. Bear this in mind, all of you, as you consider your role in this process. Those voices are not necessarily going to be part of this listening tour. Third, when someone says, whenever someone says we should have a public event to discover what are the community's priorities around safety and safer streets? My ears prick up. Why? Because safe designed, safely designed streets should never hinge upon a cheerleading contest. No offense, Andrea, or Josie, our cheerleaders around here. Uh, those voices over here versus those voices over there. As someone who experiences this town's unsafe street designs on a regular daily basis, it's disheartening when questions like what priority is our safety get determined by the loudest voices or which side turns out the most people to a meeting. So I urge this council and our staff to carefully name and frame this event so you keep the conversation focused on the issues we're grappling with in our moment today with these families and these issues, which is street safety. And I ask that council and staff be mindful that listening sessions often lack key voices. And that's where you come in. And all of us should be wary of allowing safety priorities to be decided by anything like a popularity contest, which where solely the biggest Thank or you, largest Patrick. voices determine how dangerously we design the roads of our city. That's your three minutes, Patrick. Thank you. Uh, Todd Schollenberger, followed by Matthew Duff. Good evening. Thank you, Council. Um, Thank you for your time. I think maybe my comment. Pull the mic up a little bit, thanks. Sorry about that. Um, my comments probably pale in comparison to the importance of some of the others presented earlier, but uh, however, nevertheless, uh, <clears throat> just give you a little bit about my background. Could you introduce background. yourself too, please? Could you just introduce yourself for the record? Yes, my name is Todd Schallenberger. Um, currently, I'm a laboratory manager at Colorado State University's new campus downtown. I have a background in renewable energy. Um, <clears throat> process development and regulatory compliance. Uh, I had the privilege of working for the National Renewable Energy Laboratory for four years, where I was introduced to a waste to energy program currently underway in Sweden. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I came here tonight to was to uh, initiate a uh, just an idea to put seed in your head to uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory commissions, uh, the Department of Energy and the Bioenergy Technology Office to 
do free techno-economic analysis for cities to, and municipalities to uh, evaluate waste to energy programs for free for those uh, municipalities. Mm -hmm. uh, however, somebody needs to be de designated as a representative and I'd like to come to before this council to obviously plant the seed that uh, I would like to be this representative. Uh, I'll follow up with the uh, applicable department later, but um, please consider me as a representative to the Department of Energy's Bioenergy Technology Offices for a waste energy uh, free consultation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matt Duff, followed by Kylie Duff. Hello, my name is uh, Matthew Duff. I live in District 3. Um, and uh, I just wanted to start off by saying today I um, went and sold my phone uh, to someone who wanted to buy a spare phone that I had, and I rode my bike to that. Then I went down to Main Street, and I ate at that amazing new Mexican restaurant, uh, Sencali, I think it's called. Uh, and then I went to the Apple store to pick up something. And um, I, I, for mo a lot of that traveling, I was able to ride on world-class trails, you know, and that's an incredible part of li living in Littleton are all the trails that we have. But I didn't have anywhere to be quickly. You know, I didn't have a lot of the pressures that other people have. And I, I want to frame my, my conversation uh, tonight um, around that idea that not everyone could leisurely go do that. Not everyone could go out of their way to find safe roads to or safe roads or safe. Uh, I would venture to say we don't have any safe roads, but any safe trails to travel on in Littleton. Um, Multimodal transportation is the most economically responsible and efficient form of street infrastructure. Uh, pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure is the most cost effective that we can build in the long term. The city staff knows that car infrastructure is the most expensive to build and maintain. There is upfront cost for multimodal transportation, but over the long term, it's the best way we can, um, it's the best path we can take if we want to be good stewards of our citizens' money uh, and create a financially healthy uh, city. Uh, we want city council and staff to be good stewards of our city's money and car centric infrastructure is not cost effective in the long term and it impoverishes our city's finances. Is safety really our priority as, is a question that I want to ask. So in a lot of our formal documents um, it says that but then when we hear people's commentary, it doesn't seem like it's the top priority. Uh, we have identified as a city in those documents that we want travel to be safe for all modes of transportation. Uh, and we have identified that we want to encourage multimodal transportation. However, um, the, the, some of the comments like last week had a very different focus you know, than that. And I wanted to call out that you know, we either we either double down on safety as a priority or we remove it from the document. And that's a choice you all can make too, but we can't say it's a priority and then go in different directions. Um, and then finally, um, as a city council, you represent the city. We are dependent upon you. The city who, uh, the person who cannot afford a car right now is dependent on you to provide them infrastructure that they need to get to where they need to go safely. The mother who rides her daughter to school is dependent on you. Um, some of you have made statements that imply that if, if, you know, if people want to be safe, they can go out of their way to find a trail or something like that to ride on. That's inappropriate as a city to take a stance like that. That is an inappropriate stance to take to say that if, if I want to ride for convenience, we can make world-class trails. But if I want to tra travel with direction to get somewhere quickly, I, don't have, I can't have the infrastructure provided. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Duff. Kylie Duff. Hello, I'm Kylie Duff. I have children that attend Runyon, Euclid, and Heritage High School. We know that Alati is a key route for many students traveling to school. Going north on Alati, down by Runyon, the speed limit is set at 25 miles per hour. But once you reach Ridge Road, the speed limit increases to 30 miles per hour, even though it's still a residential neighborhood. By the time these students traveling north reach Euclid Middle School, if that's their designated area they're going, um, they have crossed many intersections, some without crossroads, or yeah, cross roads, and they don't get to a reduced speed limit with flashing lights um, until they are at the, the street in front of the school. Alati is a main school corridor road and should have slower speeds the whole way. The students need a safe way to school the whole way, not just crossing the street into the door. 
Comparing this with Arapahoe High School, located on University and Dry Creek, these are busier roads, we know. The speed limit is 40 miles per hour. The whole time that school's in session, it's reduced to 25 miles per hour. So our younger students in middle and elementary school are traveling to school in a residential area, which should be slower, but they are traveling in a higher speed limit area than students going um, than Arapaho, to Arapahoe High School with um, Dry Creek and University as the roads there. Some have argued that changing signs, zoning, and enforcement won't work as drivers ignore these and can be distracted. That's why I believe that separated bike lanes are the solution that we need. Protected bike lanes can offer our young residents a safe route to school. It's not just about school commutes either, as we've heard. It's about allowing all of our residents, our families, our children, to use their bicycles for everyday tasks, like going to restaurants, grocery stores, and other places and errands without fearing for their safety. We've heard concern about traffic congestion and the potential for increased traffic with housing developments, but there's still resistance in investing in improved public transportation and safer bike lanes. It's time to prioritize the safety and well-being of our residents, starting with our children. I urge you to consider this proposal seriously and make our city a safer and more accessible place for everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Next up is Elizabeth K. Marchetti, followed by Ashley McCalla. Good evening, Council. Mr. Mayor, my name is Elizabeth K. Marchetti. I live in District 2. My kid attends Euclid Middle School and our family walks and bikes around the city and to and from school. I hope that my kid will one day feel truly safe accessing their community in ways other than from within a motor vehicle. Thank you very much for spending so much time on the subject of safe infrastructure and for continuing to listen and learn Speaking of learning, I implore you to take advantage of the subject matter experts in your midst, specifically the city's public works and planning staff who study this subject and attend national, state, and regional conferences on a regular basis during which this subject is routinely discussed. Please use city staff to help build your knowledge base about how infrastructure design directly affects public health and safety outcomes. This topic has been researched for nearly four decades. Years of research and data collection prove that the design of streets, sidewalks, and bicycle facilities have a huge impact on public safety. This is well understood by civil and traffic engineers and urban planners. Your city staff is uniquely poised to be an invaluable resource to you. Ask them to share copies of the Federal Highway Administration's guides to bicycle and pedestrian safety. Ask them to share copies of the most recent Dangerous by Design 2022 report, which was partially funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. There's been a knee-jerk reaction in this region to turn our noses up at the communities that are truly leading the way on this subject. And instead, we tend to embrace willful ignorance. I beg you to study the towns and cities who act as learning laboratories in this state, this nation, and around the globe, which offer so many techniques and strategies for our community to implement. Please also don't wait to try to get a majority of the community to reach consensus on whether this community should prioritize street safety. Please use your authority and power to do the right thing now and fully fund the budget requests made by Public Works Director Reister for 2024 what he proposed, especially for quick build infrastructure fixes, would be a huge win for our community. And you could take credit for making a bold move towards improving safety on Littleton streets, especially for our kids. Learning is fun, and learning is a survival technique. If we aren't learning, then we aren't able to adapt. If we don't adapt, we fail. As decision makers, I encourage you to learn, lean on your engineering and planning staff, and learn everything you can so that you can make well-informed decisions about the best way to make Littleton the safest city. Thank you again. Thank you. Next up, Ashley McCalla, followed by Molly O'Malley.
My name's Ashley McCullough. I live in District 3. When I moved here a little over eight years ago, I envisioned a neighborhood where my daughter could bike to her elementary school, which is less than a mile from our home. But as things stand now, that is impossible because even if she took sidewalks and trails, which has been suggested to me, she would still have to cross both Stern and Allottie without the help of even a crosswalk, which frankly scares the crap out of me. I'm here tonight to implore City Council to become a unified voice that understands that from here on out, safety in road design for all ages and ability must be our priority. You must hold city staff accountable to that same priority and work together so that we can actually begin to see meaningful changes on our streets. What does that mean? To start, focus on creating high comfort bike lanes with a barrier on the main roads that connect our schools and trails, such as Windermere, Prince, Cayley, Ridge, and Allotte. These streets are wide and there is more than enough room for both safe bike transit and cars to drive at reasonable life-saving speeds. This is not a radical or novel concept. These types of street design improvements are being done all over the country, including in our own state and our neighboring cities as we speak. These changes will make Littleton appealing to families for years to come and are a critical investment in our future. I'm also asking you to increase or find the funding to hire additional city staff, including an expert in safe and accessible road design. The other night, Mr. Reister made it very clear that the number on his staff is severely lacking and limited for a city of Littleton size. I'm confident that if we start to see changes such as protected bike lanes and narrowed car lanes, which are proven methods to slow cars down and save lives, then we will all be safer, drivers included. Hundreds more families, especially children, will feel confident using alternate modes of transportation, which in turn is proven to make communities happier, healthier, and more sustainable. The data is clear. Many citizens have come before you speaking the same message. The time to act is now, not next summer, not in the 2025 transportation plan update, but now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Molly O'Malley, followed by Maureen Whalen. Thank you. Um, my name's Molly O'Malley. I've lived in Littleton most of my life. I bike or walk on the Platte River Trail nearly um, every day, at least several times a week. And I'm here to actually ask the council uh, of why and how it was um, determined that the enormous Elon Musk space trash uh, rocket exists along the trail. Um, I'm disappointed that it's there. It's 124 feet long. It really does impact the person's experience along the trail. And I feel in Littleton supporting this also implies that we as a community support the ideals of Elon Musk, which I don't think everyone would agree with that. Um, and I feel like we've kind of just put a piece of space trash there along the trail. I know it's sponsored by DISH and mostly on their property, but I think the city really encouraged or accepted this um, monument to um, Elon Musk, spending $2.3 million, uh, which all the um, uh, evidence of other things that the city could, uh, wasn't our money spent, but if we were reimbursed for any money that was spent with the installation of that rocket, and I just think there was, we, they should have been encouraged to use that money to contribute truly to the community in a much better way. And I'd like to know what the plans are to allow um, school groups to go there. Again, DISH does not allow any parking on their property now. Will the, um, many of the people from the city, when I asked why they were doing it, that it would uh, promote tourism, bring people to the downtown area. Well, is DISH gonna provide the parking for that um, um, uh, facility? And again, it's along a bike path and how will that impact the biking? And, um, uh, and also, I was disappointed in that there wasn't a lot of opportunity that I knew of to prior have public input as to whether this was an appropriate 
um, um, I don't know what to call the thing, uh, along our bike path and in our city. So thank you. Thank you. Next up, Maureen Whalen, followed by Ben Traquier. Good evening. My name is Maureen Whalen. This is my daughter, Kate. She is a freshman at Littleton High School this year. Uh, we live in District 1. I have two other children in the LPS district. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank all of you for your time and dedication to our community. It's not lost on me the hours you spend, and we are grateful that you are here to listen. As a resident, voter, active community member, and a parent, I am here to make clear that I want our dollars spent on prioritizing pedestrian and bike safety. Um, there have been many examples given that I agree with. I won't repeat them. Uh, but also at Littleton High School, it takes, uh, there is a 17 second time to cross Broadway. Um, and it averages a group of kids 25 seconds to cross. That to me is not pedest pedestrian family friendly. Uh, around Runyon Elementary, there is so much signage for where we cannot park for private property and private residences and uh, driveways, which is appropriate. I also feel like we could have more signage not to park near the crosswalks to clear space to allow uh, clear views where we go. Um, put us to work. I know logistically it's probably improbable that the city could ask a community of people to show up to do what needs to be done if there is a staffing shortage. Uh, you know who would like to paint the street to make it more visible? Probably everyone in this room today. And I will do it. Uh, I would prefer to do it legally, so I'd like your approval. Um, but as Glennon Doyle says, there is no such thing as other people's children. And it is our job to protect all of the children. We are here to back you. We need your support. We need these things to happen now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, ben Traquir, followed by Josie Haggerty. Hello, uh, my name is Benjamin Chaquere. I live at 8417 South Reed Street. I'm one of the co-founders of a group called Littleton Social Cycle, and I'm also an engineer. I wanna talk a little bit about engineering, and I'm gonna try and do it without talking like an engineer. So instead, let's talk about groceries. Engineering design is a bit like buying groceries for a family. You have to balance goals and constraints. Um, other people have to live with your decisions. Your choices can affect the health, happiness, and safety of others. Let's say you have a bunch of kids at home and you've just been tasked with buying the groceries. You go to the store and you formulate a goal. Uh, you know calories are important, so maybe the goal is I want to buy as many calories as possible for my dollar. So you fill your cart with bags of candy, maple syrup, and cookies, and the kids are thrilled. Uh, they tell you this is exactly what they want, and they don't want anything else. Uh, it seems like you chose the right goal. At least the kids say they're happy with it, although you notice that they aren't looking too healthy anymore and they don't play outside anymore, and they're short-tempered and self-centered, and their teeth keep falling out, and every month, a few of them die. Uh, but the ones that are alive assure you that you are making the right choices. Eventually, a small group of those kids uh, comes to you and they say, we aren't happy. We aren't healthy, we want to change. We aren't saying no more cake and ice cream, but can we also have some vegetables? Can we reframe the goal instead of, as many calories as possible, maybe our new goal should be the healthiest diet possible. Uh, the kids start pulling out binders of research about the health, financial, and social benefits of a diet consisting of more than just caro syrup, and they have examples of grocery lists that you could copy. The evidence is irrefutable and their requests are attainable, but you know that there are some other kids who will be upset if you buy broccoli. They won't be forced to eat the broccoli, it won't even cut down on their own supply of cookies. But for some reason, they'll get really mad if they have to look at someone else eating broccoli. So what do you do? This is where engineering differs from shopping for the kids from Lord of the Flies. One of the great joys of engineering is making objective decisions based on standards and research. Littleton is not the first city in the world to be confronted with the physical, financial, social, and moral cost of a car-centric design goal. It's not the first uh, to address these problems either. The answers are available. The only question is, do we care about safety or not? I'm not asking you to replace every road with a sidewalk. I'm not asking anyone to give up their cars. 
I'm asking you to change the goal from all cars all the time as fast as possible to maybe some cars, some buses, some bikes, and some walking. I'm not asking you to stop buying ice cream. I'm just asking you to add some broccoli to the menu. Thank you. Thank you. Josie Haggerty followed by Keely Quinn. Hello, my name is Josie Haggerty. My address is 8417 South Reed Street, and I am also a co-founder of the group Littleton Social Cycle. I have found myself asking countless times over the past year, what is the right way to get you, council, and staff to make safe roads a priority? Do we get up here and speak to the emotional side of the argument? If roads aren't redesigned to be safer, people will continue to be killed, and this, heaven forbid, could potentially be one of your loved ones. Or do we take the data approach and quote the CDC-supported study, Dangerous by Design? 7,485 people walking were struck and killed in 2021, which would, which would be the highest number in 40 years and one of the biggest single-year jumps in decades. These tragedies are preventable more walking does not have to equal more deaths if streets are designed with safety as a top priority. However we package it, the point stands. The city of Littleton needs well-designed, safe roads for all users. The time is long past for Littleton to continue to have such poorly designed, unsafe roads. Safe roads designed for all users includes a well-maintained sidewalk, separate protected bike lanes, and narrow car lanes. Infrastructure that slows car speeds and separates cars, bikes, and pedestrians ensures safety for all. Thank you. Thank you. Keely Quinn, followed by Audrey Howes. Hi there. My name is Keely Quinn, and I'm a resident of District 2. I am here for the second month now to urge council to review the city budget to invest more in walking and biking infrastructure. As a new e-bike owner, I was excited to use my bike in place of my car around Littleton, and I've quickly learned the dangers of attempting to bike around town. Painted bike lanes are almost non-existent, and protected bike lanes are entirely a dream. I listened last week to the study session, and I heard a lot of talk about enforcement as part of the solution to making Littleton's roads safer. To illustrate how ineffective this method is, I ask you all to drive Windermere or Prince while adhering to the posted speed limits. It feels uncomfortable. And that's because, as Keith Reister pointed out, our streets are designed for faster speeds than the speeds posted. Speeding is simply a result of the standard road design of the past. According to the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety, the chance of being killed by a vehicle impact as a pedestrian increases from 10% at 23 miles per hour to 25% at 32 miles per hour and jumps to 50% chance of death with a car moving at 42 miles per hour, a speed which we all know isn't unreasonable for many of Littleton's roads. With this knowledge, we must slow traffic and keep bikers and walkers safe by, using, by narrowing the lanes, adding protected bike lanes and wider sidewalks. A narrower road will inherently slow drivers, and drivers won't need to stress as much about coexisting with bikes and walkers. An all-around improved experience. Additionally, enforcement doesn't promote an equitable Littleton. Someone once told me if it's a fine for an offense, it is simply a tax on the poor. A $100 speeding ticket might be of no regard to many families in Littleton, but for those like me who have entered into Littleton via affordable housing, it can mean skipping the grocery store. What we also heard in the study session last week was a need for more staff for the Department of Public Works, which needs to be addressed in the 2024 budget. We need staff so we can install temporary solutions that can turn into permanent solutions in the future. I dream of miles and miles of protected bike lanes, wider sidewalks, and more crosswalks. For instance, did you know that on Littleton Boulevard between Bannock and Datura, there are only four crosswalks, including the two stoplights. This type of infrastructure doesn't encourage walking, and as new businesses, such as the Littleton Brewing Company, open, we need to make it more accessible for all. I fully believe that as Littleton becomes more bikeable and walkable, we'll see more biking and walking around our city. 
This will in turn decrease the need for parking in downtown Littleton and increase community engagement. And I look forward to seeing these changes happen. Tonight, I urge council to revisit, revisit the 2024 budget and make changes to improve the infrastructure for walking and biking and the safety of all citizens. There is so much that divides us Thank in this world, and I hope we can minutes. all come together for a safer little tip. Thank you. Uh, next up, Audrey Hose, uh, followed by Jennifer Windham. My name is Audrey House, and I'm a resident of District 4. Three. We are now up to three vehicle versus pedestrian bicycle deaths in three months. One was too many. The death of Liam was unimaginable. And now we have another death on our streets. The time for action is now. I listened to the study session the council held to discuss bicycle and pedestrian planning. I heard we face challenges as a city with older infrastructure and understaffed team and budget concerns. But I also heard thoughtful questions and ideas from many council members, which would allow Littleton to move forward with changes, even temporary ones, sooner rather than later to improve safety. I loved hearing about working on a better partnership with the schools. As a member of the Euclid and District Accountability Committees, I will be sharing my notes with them about bridging that gap. This week I did something illogical. I drive almost daily from Ridge Road down Windermere to Cornerstone Park. First, I drove at 30, and then I drove the same path at 20. This 10 mile per hour reduction in speed added a mere one minute and 10 seconds to my commute. When I heard comments during the study session such as 20 miles per hour is too slow and moms need to be able to drive their kids to the grocery store, I think we're getting distracted by small inconveniences at the sacrifice of the greater good. In the 2022 article from Smart Growth America, the author said, when streets are designed primarily to move as many cars as possible as fast as possible, and people are not provided the infrastructure they need to walk and bike safely, enforcement punishes travelers for behaving logically. Driving the speed limit on many Littleton roads like I did on Windermere the other day is simply not logical. And then you add hazards such as calming circles, poorly designed painted bike lanes, and small sidewalks to the mix, and we've created an unsafe environment. So what do we do? First, I ask you to simply consider and install low-cost temporary solutions in high traffic and dangerous areas, and then monitor their success and so we can assess priorities for more permanent solutions. Second, I ask you to prioritize funding for the Department of Public Works so we can more quickly and efficiently employ these solutions. And finally, I ask you to consider a different approach to community listening. Kids biking around neighborhoods aren't here at the city council meetings, they're not going to your study sessions, and frankly, often their parents are too busy to fill out the surveys you send out. In fourth grade, I was on a team of students who designed DeCoven Park's new playground, which is still in place today. They let our imaginations run wild, and then took our design and put it as close to the requirements as possible. So what if we thought outside of the box to meet various groups in our communities like those kids and allowed them to dream about safety solutions? One was too many, two was unthinkable, three is enough. Let's get to work. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Jennifer Windham, followed by Patrick McCall. Jennifer here. Move on to Patrick McCall. Patrick McCall, it's your turn. Is that you? Well, thank you. I had two topics tonight. Uh, first was the authority, uh, boards, and commissions, and reference to the 2023 retreat where some of this was discussed. There was relatively no citizen involvement in that. And I would, this document talks about high quality governance and consolidating of uh, authority boards and commissions. That, I would say that's less democratic. And I would ask uh, the city council to look at involving more citizens rather than less. Uh, I would ask staff, please describe both sides. These uh, boards, commissions have been in place for quite some time. Why would we suddenly want to get rid of them and have less citizen involvement? It doesn't sound democratic. Um, 
when I hear administrative hearing officer in a document to where the citizens are not going to be involved in the decision, it does not sound democratic. Uh, thank you for your time on that. And I want to thank you for the three plus hours you spent in the study session on transportation. I have a few asks if you would make of the staff. I was in mapping for 20 plus years. I've never dealt with traffic. I dealt with oil and gas and mapping. The, the city of Littleton has the best GIS system there is, bar none. Look them up, Esri, ARC Info. Why there were no traffic statistics provided to you for every street in this city. We're having problems with safety of pedestrians and bicyclists. Those are all coming from vehicles. Why don't you have the stats in front of you? Why don't you have the stats of what it was today what it was five years ago, what it's expected to be five years from now. Before we start expending all this money to solve problems, let's not solve tomorrow's problem and have a gaping hole in tomorrow's problem. You need the information in front of you, and the staff should provide that to you. It, look at that GIS system. State of Colorado, Rappo County use it. Great for statistics, great for doing what ifs, great for planning your future. Thank you very much, and again, your ability to tolerate that three hours, commendable. Wish you had more information given to you. Thank you, that's all the people that we had signed up. There were people that came in after uh, the sign-in sheet was brought up here. Uh, anyone else wish to speak tonight? Come on up. If, you get, if, if there's more people that want to speak, just kind of get in a line over, over there-ish. Hi, I'm Mandy Thompson. I live in District 4, um, and my daughter attends Euclid Middle School. We live 1.6 miles from Euclid Middle School due to issues with LPS busing. My daughter um, does pre previously did bike to school many times with Liam. Um, the thing I want to bring to your attention today is pedestrian access throughout the city. Only 65% of our city sidewalks are considered safe for use by an abled body adult. 70% of those sidewalks are recommended to be used only if an abled body adult has no other option. An abled body adult is not a child, a teen, or someone that relies on a medical device for transportation. Only one-fifth of our sidewalks are considered safe for everyone of any age and ability. None of these safe sidewalks are on a route to school, a church, or a grocery store. None of them are along a road at all. These numbers come from the Transportation Master Plan, and this plan does not take into account the stress and anxiety of using sidewalks along streets. Thank you. Thank you. Next up. Hi, my name is Ginger Rohde, and I live on the corner of Fremont Court and Alati, right by Runyon High School. I have two daughters, they were 10 and 12, who go to Runyon, and one of them used to ride her bike every day with Liam. Um, I would like to bring attention to speed limits. In nearly half of our states, pedestrians are forced to use the road as the only safe place to travel. But these areas that provide no safe access for pedestrians are currently 25 to 35 mile per hour zones for cars. It is evident that city transportation planners have used the 85th percentile method to develop speed limits. This perfectly legal method uses the approach that if there were no speed limits at all, how fast do 85% of drivers want to go? It allows cars, and only cars, to dictate a speed for a road without regard for the safety of everyone that uses it and lives on it. It is also evident that there's a disconnect in priorities on our streets. When a street has a 30 mile per hour speed limit, but people walking and riding and living on the street only feel safe when cars go half that. The city installs 15 mile per hour speed bumps or traffic circles and leaves the speed limit at 30. Speed bumps should not be used to remind people of the speed they should be going, not force them to go a speed different than what is posted. This only creates bottlenecks. It doesn't make sense. 
it is time for the city of Littleton to approach speed limits in a way that allow everyone that uses a street to feel safe and comfortable. It is time that we plan the top speeds for cars based on how those that walk, roll, stroll, and ride are protected. Nearly half of our streets lack ADA accessibility. These streets should be lowered to a safer speed for cars to protect the people forced into the street to use a wheelchair or walk an elderly parent held up at the arm. That is less than 20 miles per hour. If the city wants to raise a speed on a street, it must, at a minimum, have a safe space for people, not in cars. People before cars, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Ben Thompson, um, and I have a daughter that attends Euclid Middle School, and she used to bike to Euclid Middle School. Um, now I drive her, or my wife drives her. Um, when we drive her, we encounter roundabouts. Or are they roundabouts? I think there's quite a bit of confusion regarding what the traffic furniture is um, on uh, Alati. Um, you know, if we asked three people in this room, the three of you, even the city planners, um, we would get three different answers about what those structures are on Alati and what their purpose is on Alati. Um, when in the study session last week, um, we heard that they were installed almost 20 years ago. Um, are they still appropriate for, um, you know, the, the amount of traffic that um, Alati is um, seeing now? Um, you know, they're not roundabouts. Um, they used to have signage with roundabout on it showing you how to traverse around it, but that was removed. And now they have a special little, like, target sign on it that, that makes no sense. Um, you know, the confusion surrounding these islands create an extremely fragile and potentially dangerous environment um, and can magnify the traffic spasms that occur during school pickup and drop off. Um, it's not a matter of when something will happen. Something's already happened. As a father, um, I know that, uh, you know, Things can't be changed. Uh, we can't get Liam back. Um, I have also been in higher education for a long time, and I know some things take a while to change. But I'm disappointed in the lack of action that has taken place after Liam's death. The day after Liam died, there was no police presence. There was no extra crossing security or anything on Alati. As the Littleton Council, I believe that's your responsibility, along with the police department and Littleton Public Schools, to make that change. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christine Lee. I'm from District 1. I'm actually a neighbor of you, Councilman Driscoll. I walk through your yard multiple times with my dogs. So you've probably seen me. Because we're the only block in Bomar, the cul-de-sac, that doesn't have access off bowls to anything unless you have a car. So my son schleps his bike through Driscoll's yard and Sue's yard. Thank you, by the way, to get to Goddard. And my daughter goes to Wilder um, Elementary. My husband also cycles, avid cyclist, and every day he goes in the summer, I say a prayer. I ask God to bring him back to me because I'm freaked out of Bowles. Bowles has gotten out of hand with the traffic as well as the speed, and I'd like to draw attention to that, but I came, I just found out about this event uh, four, hours ago, four hours ago through Goddard Elementary. I came to support all the parents and everybody concerned about public safety, but did want to draw attention to Bowles. It's really out of control. And um, Goddard, since the recent incidents, I've noticed at Goddard, that intersection is also very wacky and chaotic. It's not even a real intersection. There's one stoplight, and then there's like four different blocks all merging in front of the school. And the staff has to be there constantly in the morning and after school to make sure th the kids can cross safely and get around safely and for cars to maneuver safely. So. I see um, a lot of potential for us to make improvements around the city and um, especially around the schools, and I just wanted to bring attention to that. But thank you. 
Thank you. Is there anybody else that would wish to speak? Uh, my name is Pam Chadbourne. I have a block and a half from here. And um, I wanted to talk about the public comment period. Um, I was surprised at the last meeting that the public comment is being moved uh, before the staff reports. You've had a couple public comments that asked for a second period at the end of the meeting so that people can comment on what they hear at the meeting. And instead, you move our comment even earlier so we know less about what you say at the meeting. Um, please don't move the public comment earlier. That's not appropriate. Um, move it at least after the staff report so we can comment on them. Second, the board and commission protocol changes. I'd like to ask you, uh, do not act on that tonight. In fact, ask staff to go back and make the packet complete. You've been given a completely biased, what was presented was a completely biased uh, one view. We're going to do these things. And I'd say amusingly, except for me, it's sickening. Um, there's a column there for the codification. And <laughs> almost all of them are LCC uh, 2-14-3, whatever. Your retreat in February, which is not recorded, has no minutes, and the public it, it is a day and a half, so the public can't realistically attend, is not a good reference for staff to take actions like this. Um, it should not be the basis for direction to staff to do this. Reducing the size of, size of boards and commissions, reducing two of them for land use, which have historically great value involving citizens in these exceptions to land use decisions, being proposed as a single hearing officer is offensive to me as an American. Um, having five citizens on a board to consider exceptions to land use questions and decisions has great value. It brings diverse opinions to the table. It gives the opportunity for discussion and investigation one officer can be influenced. It is not the right way for a city like ours to conduct these matters. Um, and the other proposals are also questionable. Consistency, uh, we're, there, it, there's no evidence. I go to the board and commissions. I know more than anybody. I'm just going to say, for four years, Mike has been coming, but I've been to more. I'm going to tell you, we just don't have a horrible problem with managing these. We should be able to handle these. This is a basic function of cities. Um, again, I'm going to ask you to have staff go away and bring back the pros and cons of the current system, what we would be losing by changing that, the boards and commissions. You want to engage more citizens? You want more public engagement? Keep more of us on boards and commissions. Don't reduce that number. Thank you, Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that would wish to speak public comment tonight? Seeing no one, I'm going to end public comment at 7.30 here. Uh, move on to uh, item five, which is comments and reports. We'll start with uh, council. Are, are we, uh, I'll pause for a second to let people leave if everyone's going to leave here. So, Take a three-minute break. Sure, we'll take a three-minute recess.
at 738. Uh, go on to uh, comments and reports. Start with council. Uh, council Member Driscoll. Uh, yes, just a reminder that uh, tomorrow we'll be having our uh, historic downtown Littleton Merchants meeting at 8 o'clock at Littleton Town Hall. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Council Member Ryden. Uh, just a reminder that next week we will have a joint study session with Sheridan and Inglewood um, to discuss the Tri-Cities homelessness action plan and uh, what direction we want to move forward in the next few years. And that is next uh, the Wednesday, the thank you. The 13th, yes, yes. in the evening, and it's going to be in the Civic Center in Inglewood. Councilmember Peters. No report. I haven't done anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Reichert. I have less to report than Councilwoman Peters. <laughs> Councilmember Grove. A uh, couple community events I attended uh, last night. One was uh, the uh, Littleton Chamber of Commerce had a uh, event for women at Kate's Wine Bar and a gift exchange. And it was nice to meet women in the community and talk on an informal basis and learn what their issues and needs are. Second thing, there was an open house for the Denver Beer Company. Finally, we get um, a, a new business on Main Street, and so that's wonderful to hear, and they've redecorated very nicely and have lots of beer. So I encourage you to go there and participate in um, welcoming that business to our community. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tembar. Well, that was actually my announcement. Uh, also welcome them to the community. Also wanted to ask city staff if you have been or could be reaching out to make sure that they're well connected to the LDDA, especially the planning around uh, the water main replacement and yes. you know the downtown development projects. I mentioned that to a couple of the staff and they seemed extremely interested um, to be involved and to have their voice heard as a, as a new business downtown. So um, thank you for doing so. Sure. Thanks. Uh, just uh, quickly, I just wanted to once again welcome Councilmember Peters and Reichardt to their first real full meeting here. Um, so glad to have you up here. You know, trying to get my bearings straight of where everyone's sitting now. Um, I also wanted to thank everyone that uh, showed up tonight um, for the public comment period. Um, I was glad to see them. Uh, a lot of good ideas uh, presented there, um, and I hope the city manager. Uh, took some good notes there. I'm sure we'll have some uh, more thorough conversations about that. I'm glad that they're all involved. I hope people um, stay involved and stay um, having these uh, good ideas and good conversations here. Um, this afternoon, I was part of briefly for a, a Zoom meeting with some uh, state legislators um, and representatives from the governor's office on potential legislation moving forward. Uh, in the January session. This one was on transit-oriented communities, um, kind of getting some feedback on what their thoughts are right now. Um, it's is still early stages. It kind of seemed like it was more of the um, opt-in incentive uh, idea for adding density around transit, um, although I don't think that's necessarily where it might end up um, in its final stage, but it's good to actually be involved in the conversations uh, this time around. Um, having lots of people from community, um, cities a part of that and getting feedback to try to make this uh, policy um, work for for everyone and not just being uh, forced upon us, um, which kind of leads us into kind of this idea with um, where we have our legislative breakfast uh, on Thursday, meeting with some other legislators, kind of talk about what their legislative priorities are and what the city's um, goals are as well, trying to make sure that Littleton's uh, part of that conversation when it comes to state policy uh, and how it impacts and affects uh, municipal governments. And that is all I have. So I'm going to turn it over to the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, members of council. Uh, bearing in mind especially the uh, special joint meeting that, uh, that Councilman Ryden spoke to a moment ago, the special meeting next week, um, in consultation with Mayor Schlachter, we have uh, decided to cancel next week's scheduled uh, study session. We had one item planned for that uh, that can comfortably be uh, shifted to the, the uh, council meeting scheduled on uh, on December 19th. So instead of having a study session for that one item, uh, we'll add a study session following the uh, regular business of the meeting on December 19th. So that will all be updated. Uh, I'm sure it already has. But want uh, the council and the public to be well aware of that. Also just want to mention that... Uh, Several of your 
senior staff attended the University of Colorado Economic, or <clears throat> economic Forum, Leeds, uh, Leeds Business School Economic Forecast Forum uh, uh, yesterday um, at the Hyatt downtown. Um, we were joined by hundreds of, of folks from other uh, cities, but also uh, largely from the uh, private sector, many focused on real estate um, and retail. And uh, some of the themes that we heard reflect some of our own budget trends and some of our own projections in terms of retail and some of the cooling off that we're seeing in the economy. So uh, the learnings that we took from that session will certainly be um, folded into economic and budget updates as we, we go forward. And that, that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. City Attorney, any report? No report, Mayor. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next up uh, on the agenda um, is scheduled appearances. Uh, we have one scheduled appearance tonight, um, and this is kind of a, a new item that we're going to have is from time to time uh, moving forward, we may have certain uh, community members that deserve recognition for reasons um, that council members may bring up um, that we can recognize people, and we have our first one tonight, and I'm going to turn the microphone over to council member Grove to recognize um, Kim Field. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to recognize uh, Kim Field uh, for a variety of things, but specifically for an award she has received, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. And first of all, I want to give you a little bit of background about Kim. Do, Kim, do, you, want, do you want her to come up to the podium so you can talk about her while she's standing in front of us, sure. or are you going to let her sit there in the audience? And then maybe when I'm done, you can say a few words. Uh, Kim and her husband, Michael Field, moved to Littleton in 1995. She served on several boards. Uh, she served on the Littleton Museum for nine years and the city's charter review committee and the Littleton Academy Committee. She also has been on the historical preservation boards for eight years. And I had the opportunity to work with Kim on the board and she took over as chair after I left the board. Kim also served on the boards of the Denver Women's Press Club and the Freedom Service Dogs. Kim and her husband have fostered many dogs for Freedom Service Dogs and became the forever family of Croft, uh, the retired service dog. She also volunteers for the Friends of the Library and works on museum events. She's active in her church. She's written four books on Western history, along with magazine and academic journal articles on Southwestern art, Western lifestyle, and archeology. span Kim was recently recognized for the Robert L. Ackerley Award by the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. This award is not given every year. It's only given to select individuals for their significant contributions to the museum for service in anthropology. Kim began volunteering there in uh, 2004 in the anthropology department where she works with museum collections. Kim also interviews prospective volunteers and documents their stories for a long time uh, for those who have volunteered. She recalls thinking of her first day volunteering. She said, I quote, I can't believe you're letting me do this. In her nearly 20 years at the museum, she's made lifelong friends and met fascinating science, scientists and scholars. The Robert L. Ackerley Award honors Robert L. Ackerley who cared for the museum and its contents for over 50 years. He exemplifies the museum's personality and spirit. Longtime curators say, quote, every time you find something really cool in the museum, there's a trail that leads back to Bob. The Ackerley Award is a miniature bronze cast of the grizzly bear and cub statue that sits in front of the museum and has been there since 1930. Kim's name will be added to a plaque that hangs in the museum. When she first got word that she was going to receive this award, she couldn't believe it. She thought her email had been hacked and someone was playing a trick on her. Well, Kim, it's no trick. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science is lucky to have you and so is our Littleton community. Kim says, if you want to engage with your community, volunteer. 
On behalf of Littleton City Council and the, cities of, uh, the citizens of Littleton, we congratulate you on this award and thank you for your service uh, to our community. If you'd like to say a word or two. Well, just a word or two. Um, first of all, thank you so much. This is very, very special. And I can't tell you how much my life has been enriched for my, in my 20 years of volunteering at the Museum of, Na of Nature and Science. And uh, I really think that I should be giving them the award instead of them giving me an award. But I'll take it. Thank you very much. So thank you for this evening. and I really appreciate it. Congratulations. Uh, item seven on the agenda, proclamations. We have no proclamations tonight. Uh, item eight, consent agenda. Uh, consent agenda items can be adopted by a simple motion. All ordinances must be read by title prior to a vote on the motion. Any consent agenda item may be removed at the request of a council member. Um, we have uh, several items, five items on consent agenda tonight. I uh, just wanted to point a clarification for everyone in the audience and for uh, the newer council members. So the, um, often ordinances on first reading are put on consent um, to set the public reading for two weeks from now. And so then we'll get to that and have a presentation. But council can always pull a member uh, item off consent if they have uh, want to have further conversation about that. So just putting that out there. I know I told you uh, privately, but just put that on the record there. A, Ordinance 21-2023, an ordinance on first reading approving local historic landmark designation uh, for the Knight residence located at 5870 South Curtis Street. B, Ordinance 40-2023, an ordinance on first reading approving a rezoning of the portion of 700 West Mineral Avenue from Industrial Park Planned Overlay District IPPLO to Multifamily Residential MFR. C, Resolution 120, 2023, approving intergovernmental agreement, an IGA between the Littleton Police Department and the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office for use of the ACSO driving track facility. Ordinance 37, Norrance on first reading, establishing requirements for the handling of domestic violence cases in Littleton's Municipal Court. And E, motion to approve, um, ID 23, 297, motion to approve the minutes from the November 21st, 2023, regular meeting of the Littleton City Council. Poll. Is there a motion? Yes, Mayor, I'll make a motion to approve ordinance A, B, C, D. That's yes, it. that's it. I will second that. We have a motion and a second to approve uh, consent agenda items A, B, C, and D. Is there any uh, discussion on that? Okay, I'm gonna open the voting for approving consent agenda items A, B, C, and D. We'll talk about E in a second. <clears throat> the vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. Great, thanks. Councilmember Grove, could you um, discuss why you pulled this item? Yes. Yes, I wanted to make an update um, to the vote to uh, Ordinance 36 2023 on median safety. As you know, in my comments, I supported this uh, ordinance. However, I made a mistake when I voted doesn't affect the outcome. And unfortunately, we were moving so fast and had a uh, deadline to get council members sworn in that I was unable to uh, get the mayor to um, uh, acknowledge and uh, allow me to change my vote that evening. So I want the minutes to tonight to reflect that I did support that immediate safety ordinance. Thank you. So just one of the record tonight, we can't change the vote, can't change it from last time, but just one of the record, so great. All right, well, we will need a motion to approve uh, the minutes, though. Mayor, I move to approve the minutes of November 21st, 2023, regular meeting of City Council. Second. There is a motion and a second to approve ID 23297, uh, motion to approve the minutes of November 22nd, 21st, 2023. Um, any uh, discussion about that, Council? Seeing no discussion, I'll open the Maybe I'll open the voting. Okay, it's open. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. Great, thanks. Um, item nine, general business. We have two items on general business. 
9A will be um, rescheduled for a later point, so we're at 9B, ID 23290. Uh, a motion to approve a contract or engagement letter with Plant Moran for the 2023 fiscal year audit. And so uh, I'm sure the city uh, manager and finance director will kind of talk about this uh, while, we're, while we're doing this here. Um, so I'll turn it over to, to you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as you uh, introduced, the uh, staff, along with the mayor and the mayor pro tem, have now uh, completed a process of uh, requesting and reviewing proposals for uh, the uh, city council's uh, uh, financial auditors for the next several years. So I'll turn it over and ask our finance director, Tiffany Hooten, to recap the process. And then on this item, of course, we'd like to certainly uh, yield any more comment about that to the mayor and the mayor uh, pro tem who were part of that process. And then tonight we'll be seeking your direction on uh, the first year contract. Good evening, council. Tiffany Hooten, finance director. Uh, this evening, we do have a motion before you to engage with Plant Moran for the 2023 audit. Uh, the city charter requires Littleton to change auditors every five years, and our last year with Clifton Larson Allen occurred last year. So we needed to do an RFP and solicit a new auditor for the city for at least the next five years. Uh, we did put out an RFP in August of 2023. Uh, we did um, have Mayor Slachter and Mayor Pro Tem Barr participate in the review process of the RFP respondents and the interview process of our finalists. And uh, we did agree and uh, fully support engaging with Plant Moran in the next year and uh, the following four years as well. We uh, will be coming to council next year again, and we may uh, provide a four-year contract so we can fulfill that full five-year uh, stint with them. And uh, I do understand that the fees are uh, much higher than they have been in the past, and so I did just want to comment on that. There have been a lot of changes in accounting specifically related to f federal reporting, and with CARES Act money and ARPA monies out there and all the federal programs that have been uh, providing stimulus money since COVID, uh, there has been an increase in uh, federal audits, and the costs with that have increased as we go through those audits, and, and just inherently um, professional fees have increased uh, even statewide and probably uh, nationwide as well um, because it is a personal service uh, organization and they are uh, seeing the impacts of hiring and retainage and uh, fulfilling those uh, personnel costs related to hiring uh, people for their firms. Um, so I did anticipate that there was going to be an increase in the 2023 audit going forward. Um, it is a little bit more than I anticipated, but uh, we do have budget money in the 2024 budget to uh, support that. And we are uh, excited to have Plant Moran and uh, to join forces with them over the next five years uh, to perform the audit for the city of Littleton. I did want to say uh, Jamie Essenwalker and Rich Beretta are here from Plant Moran. If you have any particular questions for them, I'm happy to have them here um, before you. And you will hopefully be seeing more of them over the next five years. And again, just excited to work with them. They have a lot of resources within their firm and excited uh, to move forward with them. Council, any questions? No questions? All right. Is there a uh, customer record? Well, I would just comment that Littleton Public Schools hired Plant Moran last year to s replace their um, auditors, and I think the transition went well, and I think everyone was pleased with how that, that work proceeded. Great. Well, then is there a motion? Yeah, Mayor, I move to approve a contract and engagement letter with Plant Moran for the 2023 fiscal year audit. <laughs> We have a motion and a second. I think Councilmember Driscoll beat Councilmember Grove there, but um, all right. Is there any um, discussion or Councilmember uh, Mayor Pro Tem? Thank you. Um, no, I just wanted to compliment the staff and thank you for uh, putting together a very thorough review of the uh, submittals uh, for this work. Um, I felt very confident um, in the questions that were asked. 
of the auditing firms that were brought before review. Um, I also want to just thank Plant Moran for a great presentation and it was very thorough and comprehensive. Um, speaking to the increase in costs for the city, obviously we see professional services costs increasing across the board. However, I want to also note too that um, we are doing much more federal grant and cost matching for our grant funds, um, and that is actually pushing us into that single audit threshold, um, and our accountability for those grant dollars um, is incredibly important. So uh, the small additional expenses uh, of an increase this year, you know, in the coming years over what we've seen in the past is completely expected and entirely warranted. So um, excited to have them, their firm on board. And I'll just add up being part of the review process. Um, it was um, staff ran it very well, uh, so thank you to everyone that was a part of that. Um, all the um, applicants that applied to um, be a part of this, um, they, they were all great, good audit firms, and I think Plant Moran kind of rose to the top of there, so we're excited to work for them. And, um, you know, this is uh, something that comes before council, you know, pretty much every five years, so uh, some people may not even, you know, really know what's going on in this, except for when we get the audit report at the end of the year, and the auditors are work for council. It's basically council's um, check of staff to make sure everything they're doing everything well. So that's important that we get a good audit firm that does that and can and, and can confirm that our staff is uh, doing things uh, properly and efficiently, uh, financially speaking. So, um, with that, with that, I will open the voting to. Um, approve the uh, engagement letter with Plant Moran here. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. All right, thank you. Um, 9C, resolution 117-2023, uh, resolution adopting the 2024 fee schedule. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to City Manager and Finance Director again. Thank you, Mayor. Consideration of updated fees is an annual administrative task for the uh, City Council. Um, our, our fee schedule uh, supports many of our services. Our fees are based on the cost for uh, providing services, um, and they're intended generally to uh, uh, to address the cost of services to the uh, individual benefiting um, where that can be identified generally, which then allows us to keep our, our general tax dollars, for instance, um, focused on the more general services that benefit everyone. So that's the purpose for the uh, fee schedule. Uh, tonight, I know Tiffany has an overview of the uh, recommended fee changes. Um, and I'll also mention she can answer many of the uh, questions for the, the, the basis for the fee changes. I know staff heard, heard several questions about recommended changes to the uh, fees for the uh, Littleton Immigrant Resource Center, or the LIRC, and that's a facility for new uh, council members that's uh, located within our library. And so tonight we also have the library director and the manager of the, uh, of the LIRC here to help answer any uh, questions should council have those uh, tonight. So with that, I'll turn over to Tiffany. Good evening. Uh, before you, we have a fee resolution. This is an annual occurrence and it can be more often during the year if council does decide to make any changes, um, kind of off cycle, I'll say, uh, that aligns with the budget. Um, but we do bring uh, additional fees or changes to current fees to council, at least on an annual basis. and. At the, December, or the September 9th study session, the budget study session, uh, we did spend a little bit of time uh, talking about the sewer and storm drainage utility fees. And we briefly, and I'm gonna say briefly, touched on uh, some of the other fees. And so I'm hoping this evening we have a, a chance to discuss some of those if you have any questions. Um, but I do wanna just say, uh, we do have a process when we re review fees for the city of Littleton, and I think it's important for us to, to remember and understand that fees are not to just generate revenue. The intention is that they recover the cost that it, that it incurs for us as staff to perform that service that we are requesting that fee for. And council does have a policy within the uh, principles of sound financial management that the, the intention is to recover costs. It is council's priority or 
uh, prerogative, I guess, that uh, you don't necessarily have to recover full cost. And that's where uh, some discussion comes into place. There's a number of services that we perform at the, in, at the city that it's just not feasible for us to truly charge the cost that's related to that service. And so council makes a decision to charge something less than that. And we do have a cost of services model that we use internally in the finance department that we work with departments to identify what is the true cost of providing that service. And we have developed a schedule and we only reviewed a few this year for the 2024 budget. We do have a plan for 2025 and going forward, but we do have a, a, a costing model that we use to determine what does it cost to provide that service. Um, and we provide that to council and others and we identify do we really want to charge what it costs or do we want to charge something lesser because um, we don't want to charge something that's exorbitant right because um, we do want us to be able to provide the service and it's needed um, but we do have that cost of service study that we do internally uh, after we review some of the fees uh, we'll bring those back to council, which is where we are today. And uh, we do have recommendations on fees that would be effective January 1. Uh, if council does support these, we will post those on January 1 so that the community and those who might uh, utilize or pay those fees um, are able to, to see what they are. We do have a few uh, increases or changes in fees in 2024 proposed fee schedule. Uh, sewer and storm drainage, we did talk about that at the budget session um, uh, related to an increase of 5% in both of those. We have a separate rate model that we use for utilities for sewer and storm drainage. And uh, based on what that five-year model indicates, uh, we are recommending a 5% increase to those fees. Uh, to kind of put it in perspective for a residential single-family homeowner, it approximates to about $1.75 more per month. Uh, between both of those. So just want to kind of share what that impact is to uh, a residential homeowner. Another one is the body-worn cameras. This is the program that was started a few years ago. Um, we are seeing some requests for video footage, and so we did want to add a $30 fee uh, for um, reviewing those videos prior to releasing. Uh, community development was asking for a permit fee for a, a fence permit of $100. It's just a change in the way that we calculate a fence fee currently, so it just standardizes that in the process. And then we do have a number of fees related to LIRC. Uh, some of them are changing verbiage and kind of aligning that with what is uh, utilized in that uh, realm and uh, increasing some of those fees as well uh, to, again, help support the, the services that are provided for that um, program. And then the museum fee is not a change, it's just form formalizing the $2 fee that we charge for uh, groups who attend the, uh, the uh, museum for um, events or uh, classroom uh, trainings. Um, I just wanted to share this. This is kind of just a picture of what our cost of services um, schedule looks like. So we look at the current fee. We look at and calculate what, what is the full cost of that. We determine that by how many hours are utilized by staff, and we uh, calculate that based on their uh, personnel costs to come up with that true cost. And as I mentioned, a lot of times you... We aren't fe feasibly possible to charge, it isn't feasibly possible to charge that full cost, and so we will um, do a reduced rate. And the LIC program is one of those that we do not charge what the full cost is of providing services related to that program. Um, and we acknowledge that and we understand that. And, uh, but we do want to charge uh, a, a fee that is related to that service. Um, so we have this for a majority of our fees in uh, the city. So just kind of a, an idea of what that looks like. Um, I mentioned a future schedule. So in 2025, we have a, a pretty grandiose cost of services schedule planned that relates to community uh, services and uh, public works department, community development, and continuing looking at LIRC uh, if that's the direction. And uh, these are large fees that the city receives related to building permits and, and commercial developments and uh, residential developments. And there are a number of fees related to that, and this one will be pretty extensive in 2024. So you will be seeing probably a number of recommended changes to these fees for the 2025 budget year. 
And I think with that, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. And as Jim mentioned, we do have a couple of uh, staff here who um, would be happy to answer any questions as well. Great, thank you. Council, any questions? Yes. Council Member Ryden? Yeah. Tiffany, what would be the trade off of waiting on um, some of those until and rolling those into 2025? Not necessarily the sewer or the um, storm drain, but some of those other ones. Yeah, um, that is definitely a possibility. I mean, uh, council, you are the ones who are giving direction on what the fee might be. And if you want to uh, postpone those or extend those to uh, another discussion, it's it's absolutely possible. Um, there's not going to be any significant impact to the budget. Um, there's no going to there's not going to be any impact to the programs that are being provided, the services that are being provided by um, these fees that we are recommending changes to. Um, but absolutely, that is uh, council's decision if you'd like to um, postpone those or, or discuss them at a later date. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, um, apologies for prompting a math question in the midst of a discussion, but um, do you happen to know kind of what a grand total amount of money in terms of shortfall there is sticking with the current fee schedule for the LIRC? So for example, if we are anticipating the same usage, same uh, you know number of participants in the same programs um, with the 2023 schedule versus the 2024 schedule, mm -hmm. approximately how much of a differential might we be covering I'm going to lean on my cohorts here to maybe help. Um, they might have a better indication of what that amount might. Dennis Quinn and Glacia. Hello. 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 Yeah. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Dennis Quinn, Library Director. Um, that's an, it's an excellent question that we had not had a chance to fully delve into, but I would expect that if we, as we proceed into a more in-depth fee study in the spring, that's a number that we would be prepared, ready to provide to council. Okay. I, then I, I might ask that this be part of a follow-up item. Um, I would actually feel personally more comfortable removing this item from the approval for tonight. Um, until we have a grand total or at least an estimated total of the amount of that fee differential between the two rates um, So we know if we can absorb that within our general fund budget Okay, that would be the uh, the LIRC yeah. Fees correct sure Councilman record you have a question Thank you. I just want to kind of do a follow-up question. Is there a is if we increase the fees, th then there'll be uh, hopefully additional revenue. Is there a plan for how that additional revenue would be used? Um, uh, do, does that does that make sense? Yeah, I think increasing the fees and the intention is to to reduce the subsidy, if you will, that is currently being provided to those who are using those services. So really, just recapturing some of that cost that we're currently incurring uh, with these services that we're providing. I will say, I will add that the combination of general fund funding and the fee revenue will allow you know, the LIRC in, in this case to do more than it would if it had no fees or fewer fees. So, you know, we have a general fund uh, allocation that would not be reduced barring uh, council action to do so. Um, but if the fees are not acceptable or increased um, you know that would uh, limit in some fashion again a question from uh, mayor mayor pro tem bar you know uh, the amount of service that could be delivered yeah um, so I guess I, I, if we go with council Mem or mayor pro temp bars uh, recommendation to kind of hold off on these changes in fees and, and to address it later I, I would be very excited to see kind of a, uh, an estimate of how that'll change the overall revenue and kind of what that would be used for in terms of additional services for our community. Councilmember Grove? I, I have a question. Um, are you proposing to um, postpone the discussion of all the fees or just the uh, IRC? I, I want to be I think Councilmember or Mayor Portano just said IRC. Just IRC, but the rest you're okay with? Okay. I just, I just want to point it. 
Yeah, we, we have obligations to um, for some debt on our sewer and storm drainage, so I would be very concerned if you uh, did not support the increase in that area. I did want to just mention, too, just to kind of um, remind uh, some. So the total budget for 2024 for the LIRC programs is 279000 and currently we are anticipating recovering 22000 in fees. Uh, related to those services, so just to kind of help you understand how many, how much is, how much revenue is coming in versus the expenditures that are related to the programs. Councilmember Driscoll, Tiffany ha has the groups that have been supporting uh, the Immigration Resource Center. Have they come to the table with any money to offset our cost on this um, this grants. program? Grants. No, we haven't been able to uh, have grants um, because. Um, we are quite small, and every time we try the grants, we are um, <clears throat> somebody else gets them because they have more services to offer, and they have more structure, and they have um, they are fairly more well positioned in the city. For example, for the USCIS grant, as you know, um, we can get the students people get in Denver or in Aurora because we are in Littleton. So we we are. We have a disadvantage um, on getting those big grants, uh, and the small grants are not for immigration. The other ones that we have, we could uh, try to find. We don't provide the services. For example, <clears throat> um, we could try grants from the state or the city and county of Denver, but we don't provide the services they ask for, for refugees and others. Have we seen an uptick in uh, applications or participation because of the refugees coming to Denver? They don't come to us okay. because we don't provide the service. Okay. So we cannot compete, neither for grants nor for uh, clients. Okay. And, and so, you know, one of the things I'd piggyback on Councilman Barr's recommendation or ask is that we, we mm -hmm. once again address, you know, what citizens, uh, the Littleton, the people that live in Littleton? I mean, we're paying two hundred ninety, two hundred seventy-nine thousand dollars, and if we're only, I don't know what percentage of those uh, people are citizens uh, or uh, are registered voters in Littleton. Mm -hmm. So I'd ask around ten percent. It has been stable. Yeah. Councilmember Peters, did you have your yeah, first, and then I'll go back to you. Am I on? You're on. <laughs> Um, if people can't pay those fees, are they able to get a sponsor or any other way to, or they cannot do the services if they can't pay those fees? We do not deny services uh, if a person cannot pay. So we will provide the service, regardless of uh, the capacity to pay. And you'll, you'll also know that some of the fees are on a sliding scale based on household income to accommodate that same situation as well. Along those lines, I just have a question on that. Have you um, spoken to the users of the LIRC about the potential for fee increases and how they would be able to uh, pay that? Would it, would it, would it affect them um, that much? Um, and then the second part of that is, would you be able to provide some of the services that you do not currently provide um, if you have this um, fee increase? We sometimes we make comments like that um, and uh, the thing we have uh, um, heard recently from the last year is that our fees are really cheap. Uh, the other thing is that um, we, um, we may not charge some of the fees because we don't provide the services. So for example, we are doing TPS right now, but we are charging only one of the services that we do that is an employment authorization card so they, they can't find uh, that the, the same fee elsewhere. So we've heard, we have heard there are things like we had an increase, 50% uh, uh, increase of people paying the uh, higher amount for citizenship than we had before. So more people are paying the top of the, the fee than ever before. So either we are too uh, cheap or people are uh, getting more money People who work, I'm saying, because there are lots of people that are on benefits and we still charge the lesser fee. But you haven't heard a, heard a lot of people saying, wait, I wouldn't be able to attend if no. the fee was in No. Right. 
Uh, Councilmember Ryden. Yeah, certainly, Councilmember Reichert. So it, it feels like, um, and I guess I, I'm, I'm asking if my intuition is wrong. It feels like this is an opportunity for us to do a business plan for mm -hmm. the Immigrant Resource Center and think about how we both, um, I, 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 I mean, the argument I feel like you're making is that we're not really charging market rates and, and that's an opportunity for us to recover more costs and I, I think that's a, um, a, a, an appealing argument and I feel like uh, the city manager is saying we're not discussing cutting our current general budget funding and, and I think that's appealing as well, at least I, I'm not um, opposed to our current subsidy. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like if, you know, there, there's opportunities to uh, provide more services and, and also enable us to apply for different sources mm -hmm. of revenue and that could be part of the business plan. And is my intuition off uh, around that? I mean, it, it sounds like this might be an opportunity to grow and better serve the uh, residents of Littleton. Am I, that's kind of a yes or no question and not a deep question. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think it is an opportunity. I think, um, you know, we've seen some changes in the program over the past, you know, four to six years. We did, uh, we used to have a federal grant that we received that was about 125000 a year. Um, we had that for a number of years and then we uh, weren't renewed in that grant because there were other um, entities that were applying for those federal grants and so we weren't awarded that grant so we weren't able to continue to receive that federal revenue. Um, and there's just been changes at the national level too and um, certainly something we can look at. We've had a lot of local donations and local grants provided over the years but they're relatively small, um, probably <coughs> three, five, ten thousand 10,000 at most. Um, so I think it's just been challenging to find some dedicated funding for the program other than the federal grant and that is just not an option for us I think at this time. Maybe in the future it could be, but something we could certainly look at. Councilman Grove. If I understand this correctly, um, the budget's 279000 and we recover 22000 And you're going to come back to us or if, we, if that's what we decide, with how much we would recover with the additional fees, or do you have a guesstimate? If, if my guesstimate is it would be less than 10,000 at the current fee schedule that we're even proposing, um, probably more in the $5,000 range, so. So um, we would recover 27,000 instead of 22,000. But you have a sliding scale, so those people that are willing to pay below market rates, but are able to pay, could pay, and then if those can't, then there's a, a lesser amount. It, right. uh, uh, Councilmember Grove, I, I think, you know, th this tonight, as, as Tiffany showed you, we're planning a more extensive uh, evaluation of these fees and you know, study of these, these fees for next year. Tonight's are, are really just a, a s attempt to inch toward um, you know, a little more fee recovery in this area um, from those who can afford it um, to help us be able to kind of keep up with the cost of our services and, and do a little more than we could with the fewer fees. We know that we have more work, and we'll, we can certainly fold tonight's work into the next chapter. Um, but, you know, we knew that we were able to build the uh, 2024 budget, you know, on a little more revenue, we'd be able to deliver a little more service um, so that's what you're seeing tonight but we hear you if you'd like us to hold based off on, on the fact that you have a guesstimate and that it's nominal and that there's a sliding scale I would support the fee as recommended by staff and I think um, to I think everyone's point sort of is you know we're trying to um, wrap our heads around, even though it's a, a small portion of the, the fees that we're going to talk about later, you know, you know, fee increases are important for our, our community here. Um, and spring it on, you know, three weeks before we're going to go put on these changes, I think. In the future, uh, we need to have study sessions uh, on fee increases so we're not up here trying to um, hash out differences and so we can understand it, even though we briefly um, discussed, I don't think we have any specifics um, at the budget workshop here. Um, I think that would be a, a good policy moving forward that I would like to see that we have fee For increases sure. as a policy that we discuss more at a study session before we get to that. So, 
So we just, yeah, I've just, so if we have a, any more questions about this here? Um, yeah, okay. So then we need a motion. Someone can make a motion. I move to approve resolution 117-2023, adopting the 2024 fee schedule. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve resolution 117, 2023, adopting the fee schedule. Uh, further discussion or comments, council, on this? Council Member Wrighton. Um, yeah, so I, again, I understand that, you know, the sewer and storm <coughs> stuff, that's going to affect our capital projects in 2024, so I get that, but I would actually like to pull out the rest and wait on those since it's not going to affect the budget tremendously. I think there are some costs in there, especially around some of the costs for um, some of the cameras of the police and certainly the Immigrant Resource Center as well. I mean, Dennis, you mentioned maybe having some additional information on that in the spring. And if it's not going to affect our, our budgeting in, in huge ways, in fact, not at all, like you said, Tiffany, then I would like to wait until we can have a more robust discussion on that. Jim, I think you mentioned we were reviewing the 2025 next or next year, and that was going to be really more in depth because we're, we're going to be looking at um, some cost of services study and actually be able to see what the cost of services study is. One thing that I'm concerned about is I'm not seeing in what was presented tonight what the community impact is and the trade-offs of increasing those fees are. Um, and I really would like to be able to see that before I make these decisions. When it comes to fees, we know that those are hidden taxes. At least in my opinion, I think those can be hidden taxes. So I want to be judicious um, when I'm evaluating those. And Tiffany knows this. She sat down with me last year um, and went through line item with a lot of the fees and helped explain a lot of those to me, which I really appreciated. And I don't want to rush that tonight. So I would support us pulling um, everything except the sewer and storm for now. Any other comments, discussion? Council, uh, Mayor Pro Tem? Yeah, um, I think as it was stated that the revenue generation from the increase in specifically the LARC fee schedule would be nominal at best. Um, understanding that we do want to move towards a greater deal of fee recovery in the services that we provide both within and to residents and non-residents of the city. Um, however, I, I, I think because the revenue margin is, is, again, so minimal that we can accommodate that until we've had a more robust discussion of those fees specifically. Um, for, and just to extend on to into the rest of the fee schedule, I understand that the 5% increases in storm and sewer um, is pretty regular routine, keeping up with the cost of inflation in, in general. Um, do we have a date set for some more robust discussion? I mean, we've just experienced, we've seen the costs of emergency repairs for some of these critical assets in our city. And 5% fee increase, I mean, that is to maintain. That's not necessarily to improve or think ahead or, or invest more in the future. That is just to keep what we have and the plans we have going currently. So I guess I would, might ask the city manager when those discussions are scheduled for. Yes, regarding, I'm guessing, stormwater storm primarily, and since that's been the issue that we've been focused on. Sure, yeah. Um, to uh, relay the sentiment of our public works director when I ask him the same question. Uh, we are still managing the kind of uh, critical kind of crisis projects that we have. Uh, we know that we need to get back to council. It'll be springtime when, you know, after we're able to kind of get through these, the major ones that we, we have now, the project on uh, mineral, for instance, is finishing up now. There's one more. Um, I think that's on the urgent list now, but we do plan to get that. We know we need to get that back to council because we do need that, um, the longer term plan that includes, you know, probably numerous funding sources that will probably uh, lend itself toward um, additional fee considerations in the future, but that will be a forthcoming in the, the spring of this year. I will note that um, on the sewer fund side, the sewer funds that we have and the 5% the is part of a pretty, uh, a very robust model that, the, that our uh, South Platte Renew plant staff keep and factors in anticipated costs over the next 10 and 20 years, some of which will be quite, uh, quite, quite significant uh, re related to some of the uh, major new state uh, 
regulations coming down the pike. So um, those fees, it's important that we keep up because what often happens to cities who don't see the, the need to raise fees by a certain amount um, with a long range view, you can get behind and then when those improvements are staring you in the face, you have to make much more dramatic fee increases and I, I am confident and I really admire um, the plant staff um, and their forethought and how they're working with both Englewood and Littleton um, to ensure that we're ready for those when they have to be made. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Any other comments, uh, Councilman Peters? So I feel like I heard you say, if we do small increases over time, that's easier on the city and the citizens. Yes, ma'am, yes. underscore that. <laughs> Um, I do have a, a, a question. I'm not sure who I'm asking it to, but is there anything precluding us from, let's say, um, adopting the fee schedule as presented tonight and then changing in the 2024, early in 2024, if we do that, um, you know, ahead of 2025? No. No. Okay. Mayor, why would we want to do that? I was just uh, approving the fee schedule as presented or uh, versus... My question is, uh, what's the rationale for approving it and then changing it again next year, maybe rolling? I, I assume you're talking about rolling it back or, or what? I, I just want clarification. It, my, my question was more on um, not pulling everything out besides sewer and um, stormwater there and then getting to it and then amending it early in the year anyways to add LARC and community development, and, and are, you, are you talking body worn cameras too? Is, I mean, everything but sewer and stormwater is what you mentioned. Correct. Granted, there has been no amendment to the motion here, so this is hypothetical right now, but. Um, then I was gonna ask the city attorney to help me understand what, would I, what I would need to include to amend that. I don't know if that would be section one and amending exhibit A. Hang on one second, uh, council member. Does that make sense why? Not really. Okay, <laughs> well, rather, so rather than pulling part of the fees out and not, amending them tonight, amend them, um, approve it tonight, and if we need to, amend it later, um, or, or not. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Council Member Reagan. Yeah, so Reed, what would, what would I need to, um, what would the appropriate language be for me to make that amendment? Uh, one moment, please, while okay. I pull up the resolution. And again, I'm not like saying no to the other other fees in any way. I just think what needs to be a little bit more um, granular I information. Um, anytime again, we're increasing fees. Um, I'm concerned about that. I think in, I would say, uh, Councilmember, we've we've we know we've heard that interest from from council more globally about equity, um, and I think the sliding scale attached to the LIRC fees that are in question tonight give us, gives us a little bit of confidence that we, confidence that we can mitigate um, the potential impacts of impact disparity um, for those, those fees. I think uh, that should be an ongoing consideration for us. We don't have that information you know, now and it would be hard to, hard to gather. I think the a uh, sliding scale or allowance for those who are unable to pay is kind of a shortcut to some of that mitigation of the impact. Do we need to have a little recess so we can come up with wording on exactly what an amendment would look like since the... There's, there's a motion on the table, not... We have a question about what wording for an amendment would be to oh. remove um, gotcha. a bunch of those fees. And since the resolution is pretty concise, trying to pull out the, everything but the stormwater and, and sewer would be. Yeah, just a couple of minutes. It's really more of the 2024 schedule of fees that right. would be I was trying to figure out which so pages. What, what's the part that right. we. All right, so uh, let's go for a, a, we'll do a eight minute recess and be back at 840.
All right, it is 8.39. We are um, reconvening here. Turn it back over to Councilmember Ryden. Yes, I'd like to make a motion, Mayor, a motion to amend the 2024 schedule of fees to only include the sewer and stormwater fees with all previously adopted fees staying unchanged. Second. So we have a motion and a second to amend uh, the main motion um, to remove all the fees except for the sewer and stormwater. You want to understand that? Any um, discussion on the amendment here? And again, my reasoning behind that is just to give us a little bit more time. We know it's not dramatically going to affect our budget. Um, and I think there are some things we just didn't discuss. And certainly there were questions that many of you had about the operations. Um, Council Member Reichart, you had one about like just the business things behind Bell Hilton Immigrant Resource Center. And I think all that could be discussed. We have a little bit more information next year. Dennis, you alluded to that as well. And I think it doesn't really hurt us to wait. Okay. Any any other comments? Um, I'll just say I'm not going to support the amendment. I, you know, while I understand the concerns, you know, I had lots of questions about the fees as well. Um, I think we can have this discussion and change them e after. Um, even I don't think it's going to, um, you know, affect one way or the other our budget or uh, payments of um, people that are making those um, those fees. So that's where I am on that. And if no one else has anything else, I will open the. Voting on the amendment to the main motion. This is an amendment to remove everything uh, from the fee schedule except for the sewer and storm water. So a vote yes means you will remove all those. A vote no is you don't want to amend it and keep it as is. The vote is two in favor with council members Reichart, Grove, Schlachter, Peters, and Driscoll voting no. The motion to amend fails. So we're back to the main uh, motion, which is to approve the fee schedule. Anyone have any other uh, comments or questions? I did have one question that I didn't ask before. I know I sent it in about the, um, from community development with the fence uh, permit. And so as someone who recently built a fence and went through that process and paid the permitting fee, and I just wanted to make sure this was, um, there already is a permit fee. This would be basically offset the permit fee for the calculation of the, the cost of the equipment and everything with that is just a flat fee for $100 per fence. Is that what the idea is? Right. So what we're doing is we're carving out the calculation that is based on the value of the project, and we're making it a flat rate for the fence piece. So someone putting up a $2,000 you know, small fence or someone putting up a $80,000, you know, very large fence. Either way, it's $100 uh, per fence. I'm um, going to say yes on that. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Mayor. We'll, as I know there are more than uh, 60 fence permits, it's a popular permit. It's common, and this will kind of, I think, But there's more fences than those 60. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there are. Replacements, replacements. <laughs> um, but that will, that will avoid some of the, the fence calculation angst, angst that happens yeah. for those permits now the, um, and just, pull, just pull, that, pull the fence out of the project for calculation of the permit and just call that $100. Correct. Because that's, that's uh, commensurate with the staff time and the effort that's needed for so, those permits. So staff time reviewing those, a tiny little fence or a very large fence is not necessarily all We're that willing different. to, I think it's fair to look, look okay. at the overall fence program and that's, we, we think that'll, that'll cover the, the revenue target. Okay, and I think we also, the staff needs to do a good, better job of getting word out that we, there is a permit required for <laughs> fence because <laughs> I think that is kind of a, no. a common misperception that um, there's no permit required for a fence. So. And I count me as someone who is hiring a contractor right now and just learned that there's a fence permit. So <laughs> well, I'm thank very you. I was going to say, if you're going to say I'm not doing one, I was going to tell you to be real quiet there. I'm excited <laughs> to know about that. So it's good. Thank the, you for that education. The trick is just to replace a certain amount of slats each year, and then that way you get, a, get around that. That is legal advice from the city attorney right there. <laughs> thank you. That, that's not our current plan, but I really appreciate that guidance. I think we should charge per slot. Oh, boy. Okay, let's see. Uh, Councilmember Ryden has another uh, comment. Yeah, uh, council members, I can't vote for this in the way it is currently with it all clumped together like this as much as I wanted to be able to support parts of it. Um, those fees without a bigger discussion on 
the bigger picture of where those fees are coming in, some of those are 100%, you know, we're doubling a lot of those. Um, and that really does, I'm concerned about the end user. And even when we have sliding scale fees and things like that, oftentimes folks are not aware of that upfront that they even have that option. And so that deters them from services. So that's again, another reason that I'm not always in favor of that. And we just, I wanna see us be more diligent and more thoughtful when we're um, increasing fees. So I'm gonna be a no. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Just real quick, um, you know, it would be, I'm actually going to be voting in favor of the fee schedule, but I would ask that if the library staff could just keep track of some of the numbers and the attendance rates um, over the course of the year. So if we, we can look for attrition, um, that would be very helpful to know if the fee schedule is impacting the service. Thank you. Without any further comments, I'm gonna open the uh, voting. We're on the unamended main motion to approve the fee schedule as presented. The vote is six in favor with council member Ryden voting no, the motion carries. Great, thank you. All right, item 10 on agenda tonight. Uh, ordinances on second reading and public hearings. We have one item tonight, uh, ordinance 28 of 2023. Uh, this is an ordinance on second reading, repealing and reenacting uh, 4-1-1D of the Littleton City Code by adopting the 2023 National Electric Code. Um, and so, as I'm off to say, so we will have, as this is a uh, ordinance on second reading, it's, there is a public hearing required. We will have a presentation from staff. Um, council can then ask questions uh, about the presentation or any questions that you have that arise. Then we'll open a public uh, comment period. Uh, the public, if anyone's here that wants to comment it, can comment it. Um, if it sparks any further questions, we can ask questions of staff again. Then we will have a motion and a second, and then we can have further discussion um, on that item before we vote. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to the city manager. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, normally for a, a building code update, our chief building official would be uh, presenting this this to you. Uh, we currently have a vacancy in that role. We have a temporary coverage with a very experienced uh, contract partner that has been great support for us. Um, but we are fortunate to have our, have Reed Betzing, uh, who is also quite well, well versed in, uh, in, in building codes and these processes, kind of carrying this project across the finish line for you. So that's, uh, that's why, we're, why we're structured the way we are. And, I'll turn it over to Reed. Yes, and we received feedback uh, that council appreciates a ton of slides. And so I guess what I heard is more slides, less discussion. And um, so as the attorney, I don't listen to that, so I have no slides. So um, basically, the NEC comes out, the National Electrical Code versions come out every three years. And the state of Colorado has a rule, a law, that requires other local jurisdictions to adopt the same, I guess, year or issuance year um, that they do. So the state of Colorado adopted the NEC on August 1st, 2023. And that requires all other local jurisdictions to adopt that same code. So it makes your work uh, pretty easy tonight, I will tell you. Uh, probably the biggest highlights from the 2020 changes to 2020 NEC to the 2023, I would say as a non-electrician, um, but I do have quite a few poor remodel projects in my house to back that up. So I feel- Did you get permits for those? You know, just minor changes here. He doesn't live in the city of Littleton, so- Replacing you know. a, a light socket. Um, but a lot of the, the changes going on in the NEC recently have uh, been around GFCI, which is ground fault circuit interrupters, um, those things that are in the kitchen that flip and that you wonder why this isn't turned on. Um, it's basically been a, a pretty large expansion of that uh, throughout various places within kitchens. So before it used to be, if it was within something, Stephen will nod no, but I think it used to be like six feet of like, any sort of water source, then you would have to have GFCI. That has really spread, especially in kitchens. Um, so basically the requirement is for new kitchens or remodels, um, you're pretty much gonna have to have GFCI everywhere in that kitchen, regardless of whether or not it's servicing 
um, a countertop or a cooktop. Um, you're going to need it for a microwave. You're going to need it for dryers now. Um, so that's how the National Electrical Code has gone. Um, most of the jurisdictions, the reason why we're adopting it, I'd say a little bit early, is just to uh, kind of stay with the same timing of other jurisdictions that are also adopting or have adopted the 2023s. Um, so that other contractors coming in know that they're on the 2023 code. So um, this went to our Building Board of Appeals, who recommended approval back on September 20th, 2023, uh, with no amendments. And that is what's being proposed to City Council tonight, is the adoption of the 2023 NEC with no amendments, as was adopted by the state. Council, does anyone have any questions on adopting the National Electric Code? I have two. Uh, first, what would happen if we don't adopt it, if it's state law, just for my own edification? Steve? Wouldn't the mayor be fined? I, I would be, I, yeah, I, I would have, I just, con yeah, just, I would I'm have just wondering, concerns huh? of electricians <laughs> and those persons trying to service uh, or do work within our city knowing that they're doing it not to code. So I would have just know if there was any real recourse from the state saying that if we decided to be a petulant municipality and didn't yeah. do it. So, okay, just wondering. Um, and then, second, uh, I sent this an email. Um, this is probably more for the city manager. But this idea of stretch codes that are even more stringent, um, but that would be um, optional um, to kind of further some of our. Uh, environmental or, or climatic uh, goals here. I know there are stretch code recommendations out there to, you know, it kind of, I'm thinking more along the lines of the IHO is, hey, if you do, if you do this, we will give you something. I don't know what it is, but has, has there been any discussion along that from staff and then even for, um, um, yeah. Yes, Mayor, I know that our staff is aware of, you know, of, of some of those kinds of codes that are being uh, adopted, I, I think. You know, we're, that's in the category of, of a number of potential uh, initiatives or projects that could be, be taken on and uh, prioritized with the um, with council's direction following our Environmental Stewardship Committee recommendations and action plan. So um, I think that could could tie in with, uh, with, with the, or the, I could follow that project and uh, potentially tie in with some of our fee schedule work that we've talked about tonight too. Great, thanks. Any other questions? All right. Sorry, Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, uh, we do have a contractor communication outreach plan or something like that associated with ad adopting these codes, correct? Yeah, as in we are reaching out to the contractors who are registered with the city. Um, yes, yes. To, to let them know, okay, yep, thank you. For sure. And I think it's a fairly, this is a time, as, uh, as the city attorney mentioned, that many of our cities in, in the area are also taking this same action, so there's, there won't be surprise. Okay, thank you. All right, without any questions, uh, as the ordinance on second reading, I'm going to open the public uh, comment portion at 8.52, uh, see if anyone signed up to comment on this. We have no one signed up. Is anybody wishing to come and speak? Come on down. I'm Pam Chapdorn. Pam Chadburn. I live a block and a half from here, and uh, I live in a 1952 house, which has some GFCI in the kitchen and bathroom, fortunately. Um, but we have a lot of 50s homes that um, need this kind of um, bringing up to code when work is done, and so I'm glad that um, this is being brought forward at a minimum. But I appreciate the question about environmental sustainability. Um, when improvements are made to structures, they're usually um, not frequent. They're, they don't happen often. But when you have the opportunity, you really ought to plan for the future, the life cycle of that improvement. And so I'm thinking of things like heat pumps and um, air exchangers and those kind of things which can make homes more energy efficient especially affordable housing, especially affordable housing needs these. And the other thing is electrical, accommodation of solar power and the converters uh, to charge your cars and stuff like that. Um, I don't think that those are in here. I think that Littleton ought to at least consider those. I'd like to hear more about that. I, I've been going to ESC. 
Um, all of their work product has not been posted. <laughs> it's kept secret, so I don't know what it is. I'll find out when you do, I guess. But um, I would like the council to think about that and have that. This is These are 20-year, 40-year decisions, investments. And we in Littleton should be leaders. I mean, I hear that over and over in, in meetings. Oh, we're going to lead. But then it comes to something like this, and we do the minimum. Leadership in this area for structures and energy um, would be looking at what's best for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Seeing no one, close it at uh, 8.55. Um, all right, Council, is there a motion? Yes, Mayor, I move to approve Ordinance 28-2023, an ordinance on second reading, repealing and reenacting 4-1-1D of the Littleton City Code by adopting the 2023 National Electric Code. I can second. I have a motion and a second by Councilman Ryden to uh, approve Ordinance 28, which um, adopts the 2023 NEC. Any further um, discussion on this item, Council? Yeah. Seeing no discussion, I'm going to open the voting. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. All right, and with that, we are adjourned from the regular meeting, um, but we have an encore over there at the table for a study session. So we will take a three, four minute break to get over there and reconvene and
are back on the dais after some technical difficulties going over to the, uh, the tables over there. Uh, we've got one item on the study session tonight. Um, we're going to talk about uh, authorities, boards, and commissions. And we did hear a little bit in the regular meeting from a few um, community members. I think there was a little uh, misperception of what we're talking about here tonight. There was no predetermined outcome. This was kind of to get council's feedback on how are we, do we want to reimagine some of the boards and authorities that we've talked about this. Uh, the previous council talked about it for uh, the better part of over a year uh, on specific to certain boards, um, but also to kind of have some continuity between um, some of the different types of boards um, and kind of what they do. And so uh, we've got a presentation, a short presentation. Staff will be very concise, and, um, and then we'll kind of get some questions to uh, kind of further the conversation. We're not determining anything right here. We're not, you know, and nothing's going to be in stone, but staff will definitely come back. Um, to us and say, hey, this is kind of what we've got here. Um, we wanted to do this right now because um, we got our authority boards and commissions uh, recruitment going out, um, coming up here, and so we wanted to have, if there were any changes that we discussed, to have that kind of ready to go. So, City Manager. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks for your flexibility in our study session arrangement here. Um, yes, this, this item and questions about um, boards, commissions, authorities, uh, structure and protocols and how they operate. I've certainly heard them for a year and a half since I've been here, and that prompted a segment to be planned at the council's retreat last uh, February um, for some more conversation about the kinds of questions council had, um, changes that, that could be made. You know, I think it's healthy, uh, healthy periodically to look at how our boards and uh, commissions look in, to in uh, totality and how they are operating. You know, as each board or commission has been formed over time, they have, for instance, a charter document, they might have some bylaws, and those accumulate o uh, over time. And that's where I think council members, you know, especially those if they've had experience on, on boards or commissions, say, hey, you know, can some of these things be more consistent? What do we want, want to do? So that's where this, this came from. And uh, again, we had captured many of the questions about um, kind of the various ways that boards have, have boards commissions, ABCs, let's call them, have officers, um, how they're scheduled, how they were communicating. We made some upgrades or we had some direction from council at the, at the retreat about how you wanted to hear communication about ABC's activities. That's You'll see that again tonight, but that's more of a check-in. So anyway, um, I want to re, re introduce Elizabeth Watts, who is the, the management fellow in the, city, in the city manager's office, sitting next to Mike there. Um, she and you, I, I know we, we all probably, well, most of us remember uh, Sama Fox. Um, Sama and, and Elizabeth had started the review, re, you know, really uh, researching the, the specifics of all of the uh, ABCs. You'll see a um, spreadsheet in, your, your, in your, your packet that really has a lot of detail about each of them, what they do and how they're, they're structured. Um, Mike has jumped in on that. Mike Gent, our deputy city manager, and worked with Elizabeth to compile this kind of across the board re, uh, review tonight and then tee up some questions for council's response to uh, potential changes that could you know, it, it could improve consistency, clarity, we, we think, for a ABC members um, and kind of give us that periodic check-in that we think is healthy. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Elizabeth, who can walk us through some of the topics that were uh, discovered and uh, some of the questions that we have for you tonight. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, without belaboring too much, I did just want to uh, give a special thank you to Carol Olds, who did a lot of this initial research while the library was closed um, for a couple weeks earlier this year. Um, and so she, uh, while like I took over, I just really appreciate all of the, the work that she did and you heard from the library. And, um, so just wanted to say a special thank you to her um, for doing a lot of the groundwork on this. So back in your retreat in April, you um, asked staff to do a more comprehensive look at all of our ABCs. Um, 
and then what we are doing tonight is to come back to you and say here is sort of what we um, what we learned from that research and some options that you have for consistency moving forward. Um, we have a number of ABCs uh, with sort of a sprinkling of different charters and different bylaws. Um, some uh, uh, we have 14 of them, to be specific. Um, of these 14, two of them are authorities who are autonomous, and so council really uh, appoints their members, and so none of the recommendations that we're really talking about here will be uh, applicable to those two. And so that's the Littleton uh, Downtown Development Authority, uh, and then the South Metro Housing Options. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not necessarily going to read all of these to you, um, but these are all of our uh, 14 ABCs. Um, and for the rest of this, I will likely refer to them as ABCs, but authorities, boards, and commissions. So we have a number of questions, as Robert pointed out, uh, that we just want to make sure that we are getting your direction on, on how you would like us to come back if there are code changes or updates to the handbook that we need to make in the interim after this uh, council study session. Um, as we go through the presentation, it's up to you if you'd like to, we have questions on each of the slides that relate to these. Um, so we can stop on each slide if you'd like to have discussion then, or we can save it until the end. It's, it's however you'd like to do it. Does council have a preference on that? I thought it might be easier if we're on that slide where we're talking about, let's see, the first one with naming conventions. We can just talk about that rather than having to flip back and forth between slides at the end. Okay, great. Great. Wonderful. All right. So we will kick it off with naming conventions. Um, in our research, there's not quite a specific um, practice when it relates to uh, the name for a given authority board or commission. Um, it's possible that a, a specific naming convention might garner some clarity or even uh, specifically by type help establish some of the uh, guidelines or expectations of certain uh, ABCs. So it's possible that you can consider a structure similar to the one that you can see on the screen um, where we would have commissions where they are quasi-judicial. Commissions are largely making um, decisions based on an existing document, so the city code. Um, a board, which is traditionally advisory in nature. Um, those boards would be convened for ongoing advisory duties to council. So um, if there's ever an instance that you need a recommendation from them, that, that would be your board, but they are not making quasi-judicial decisions. Um, a committee could then be uh, similar to a, a regular advisory board, except uh, may, maybe you need a committee for a specific purpose. Um, and so they would have a, a two-year um, or one year, really, whatever you determine, uh, but uh, an opportunity for them to deliver on a specific outcome, and then council would be able to make determinations on um, how best to move forward with those committees. Are there any questions um, about naming conventions? What are you thinking? I mean, quasi-judicial planning commission, or no? The, the, that's the the category they are, and I think it's it's an I'll say oversimplification because they also do they're legislative they're you know they're, they're enacting things, right. whereas next gen or or transportation mobility are really they're kind of just discussing stuff and providing advice to council on other things. So, so the I quasi's understand. would be commissions, right? Advisory boards would advisory bodies would be boards, so. And then, you know, advisory bodies that might be convened for a shorter time frame or something specific could be committees. So we're, we're trying to find some consistent. Right. So when you see a commission, you know, oh, that's what that's, that's what. Because right now licensing authority isn't an authority. And an authority, it means something. So you're trying to put all of our 14 boards and commissions into commission, board, or committee? Correct. Twelve of them, correct. Yeah. So, so a specific make, example would be okay. the historical preservation board if you were to adopt this would become the historical preservation commission uh, and and the arts and cultural commission would become the arts and cultural board if you were to adopt this 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 proposed format it's because just it's yeah more about it's like um almost for form based zoning the, the form Correct. of the board what they're doing we're going to classify that just because the nomenclature is kind of off um i i think it's a great idea i i support it so i think we need to yeah, we're not we're not we're not voting. So I mean, does anyone? I mean, does anyone have any questions about that? More than that, or anything that kind of? Yeah, yeah. I think as a newbie, it's really helpful. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Great. Uh, next, I will preface. There are two slides for bylaws and charters. I already lied. I said that there would be one question per slide. Um, bylaws and charters are largely uh, to establish the the conduct of. Um, of how a board will be run. Currently, we have 
uh, a bit of a uh, n not consistency uh, in that some ABCs have bylaws, some have charters, um, and some don't. So some have uh, enacted their own specific charter or bylaw. Um, and council currently uses the uh, protocols, standards of conduct, as well as the legislative rules. And in both of those documents, they reference ABCs. Um, so it's possible for those to sort of solidify and serve um, as charters and bylaws. And we speak to ABCs uh, in the charter itself. I will uh, let Colleen provide any more specificity to that if you have questions. Um, but essentially, um, it would be possible that we could use the handbook as one source of truth for all uh, charters and bylaws. Right now, they're um, a little bit across the board, so not there's no consistency there. Um, and it would also make it potentially easier for residents um, as well as staff to find any information that they need on a given board, uh, council members as well, um, so that you are looking in the handbook for any specific uh, information related to how that board functions or runs that is potentially abnormal or required by um, charter or um, state statute. And I, th I think there is a, probably a little more consistency than you're hinting there. With I mean, they all follow those legislative rules and the, and the protocols. I think that, I mean, that's good. We kind of have that handbook. The one thing that I personally see we need to have kind of more a, a charge, I'm going to say the word charter, but a charge for each board of why they exist and what their, their purpose is and what, um, what yeah, why they, and why council has created them. So I think that, I mean, we did that for next gen, we did that for the DDA, we did that for um, environmental stewardship um, group, whatever they're, the ESC. Um, and so that, I mean, that's the only yep. thing I really see with that, but. So I think with this, our thought is that those charges, right. which can also, have also been captured in charters, mm -hmm. we call them different things, right, right. could be you know, built into this handbook where each each ABC would, would have its page of its purpose and kind of some of those, some of them have uh, have unique qualifications for members. You know, if you need the realtor, you need some other, you know, there are some of those. Though any anything uh, unique to that ABC would be on that page. Then, you know, the other section of the handbook would be the kind of standardized uh, protocols, operations, things that are not unique to any one board so that folks could kind of see the rules that apply to most or all, but then at the same time, see those original charges yeah. and charters for No, I think it's committees. a good idea to have a one-stop shop for community members that want to know, hey, I want to get involved. What, what's, what are all these things? What do they do? What's, how, how do I have to interact with them? So, yeah. Um, Councilmember Grove and then Councilmember Reichert. Uh, you would include the protocols in there too? Well, so the protocols uh, do apply to the boards. So the protocols and um, standards of conduct uh, do mention the boards and apply to the boards already. Um, they would. We, they would. We can, and there might be some tweaking of them based on the type of body it is um, for the protocols. Because the protocols may change a little bit differently, but yeah. So I, I have a little bit of ignorance around kind of how the boards, ABCs are functioning in Littleton. My assumption is, and I'm at, so I'm asking you to check my assumption, is that there are some boards and commissions that um, are, it's, it's pretty, it's not challenging to maintain membership and maintain engagement, and some other boards and commissions, maybe it's more challenging to maintain. And so if we decide to maintain, and, and, and that plays into a conversation whether each one needs to exist. I mean, if you can't get anybody to participate, maybe it doesn't need to exist, and that's a separate conversation. But I have, I, have, uh, I have concerns about um, uh, membership and, uh, and terms um, being um, common for the, for the sake of being common versus being, uh, having some flexibility to meet the needs of making sure that that board and commission has, has the participation that it needs to go forward. And I think that's a diff another slide that we'll get okay. to that. I think this is more of just the, should we kind of consolidate and make sure the, 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 the bylaws, charters, charges, whatever we're gonna term are, there's consistency there because there is not consistency amongst the boards that they have a document that says, this is why you exist, this is what you're gonna do or what you should be doing. Yeah, no, I absolutely support that. That that was a common practice in my prior role. So yeah. I mean, that feels Mayor good. Mayor Proton, did you have a? No, no, I'm just giving my thumbs up. No, no. I think I support you. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, next we have number of members and alternates. So um, this might get to some of the question that um, Council Member Reichardt is, is referencing. But um, right now we have ABCs that range for anywhere from five to 15 members. Um, and there's an opportunity to foster and potentially uh, encourage consistency with the council structure to set a standard of seven. Um, with no alternates. Right now, um, a few of the ABCs have alternates, and you can see which ones do um, in your overview document. Um, alternates uh, currently sit on the board, and then if there is either no, uh, not a quorum or they're missing members, then uh, the alternate would be able to vote. Um, there's there's not consistency with, consistency with that as it stands. Um, we see that there's a potential to foster uh, a council structure with seven, if if that's something that you're interested in. And we note, I, I might ask Colleen to just chime in on, on experience with uh, with quorums and the extent to which the alternate model has been used. Um, absolutely. So the alternates and Council Member Grove knows this um, from service on a board. Um, the alternate can participate in conversation, can ask questions, but they often don't get an opportunity to vote if they're kind of the odd man out. Um, and what we have seen in some of our boards is the alternates don't show up at all because they know they're not going to be able to participate fully. Um, or um, we have in my tenure, we have never not been able to conduct business for lack of a quorum with or without an alternate or two. Councilmember Grove. Um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned that I think is really, really important, um, having been on a board that was an alternate and then moved up, um, first of all, you get to be on the board longer um, because it doesn't count. Second of all, the um, plan- it, it does count. Oh, well. Toward your term. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but I was on before my term started, whatever. Um, the important thing is like planning commission and HPB is such a steep <clears throat> learning curve that I think it's very difficult to come on and be able to vote intelligently if you haven't been there for a while. And that's my opinion. And I would advocate keeping alternates for those two for that reason. I would like to counter that <laughs> in that council has no alternates and this is just a steep, if not a steeper learning curve. <laughs> so, so if I can add a comment, um, I, I have heard what, what Councilor Grove has just articulated from several of the board members as well. Um, I, I have also heard from those same board members that we need a better onboarding process that, that really helps the appointees mm. to these ABCs be high functioning as early as possible. So one of our goals, along with creating some consistency and adopting these things, you know, this guidance that you're giving us tonight, is to ensure that anyone that you appoint to these boards, these ABCs, have a chance to, to, to you know, understand their responsibilities and fulfill them immediately um, when they're put into that position by, by you. That would be great. However, these, um, with HPB and uh, Planning Commission, <clears throat> it, they're so technical. Um, reading plans for the first time, I, it, it's just it's just difficult. And I, I, I'm a firm believer in alternates for those two boards. Anyone else? I, I would say we don't need to have the alternates on the boards. Um, you know, it, they, they serve a functional purpose for retaining quorum and conducting votes. And the learning curves can be, the learning curve for being on a board is the process by which we go through selecting those members who are qualified to be able to make those decisions walking into it. And if somebody has a desire to um, up their knowledge for that particular board or commission and how they function, there's no restrictions about participating and sitting in on those meetings as a member of the public. Mm -hmm. So all it does is add administrative complexity and diffuse the um, uh, authority without necessarily giving that person the means by which to do any to conduct business. So I would be in favor of removing the alternates. Uh, oh, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you, Steve. Uh, you know, we talked about this last year, and I again, I think uh, <clears throat> the alternates are uh, are not needed for any board. Yeah, I'll, I'll mean I. Yeah, I don't, I don't support the alternates. I understand the purpose and, you know, I, there, there's argument to be made with that. And you know, I'm not discrediting the fact that, you know, that, that can help. 
Um, I think when we have it for some and not others, and you know, we do have people that have been alternates and not stayed on, resigned because they didn't want to. Um, thankfully, as you know, Councilmember Barr, you know, we have there's a process for selecting people, and you know, taking a jab at new council members here, there are no unopposed races for <laughs> boards and commissions. So if there is someone that's not qualified for the board or commission, we don't have to fill it. We can wait till we have a qualified person. Not saying that you would be either of those people, but you know, just put it out there. Wow. <laughs> didn't get that on the school board, did you, Robert? <laughs> Yeah, uh, council member. Uh, Colleen, could you, you mentioned that there's like, uh, you've noticed lack of attendance with some of the alternates. Can you speak to more specifics on that and just what trends you've noticed? If there's certain boards that don't ever, the alternates never show up or? So not in recent history, um, but with uh, the licensing authority specifically um, and with um, our board of adjustment and board of appeals, um, with licensing authority, when we still had alternates, oftentimes we wouldn't have them in attendance because they didn't get to participate in the meeting. Um, and with our Board of Adjustment and Board of Appeals, we already have a hard enough time getting them here for meetings because they meet so infrequently. Um, we currently have an alternate on one of those boards who has attended one meeting. Which, which one? Um, I'd have to look and see if it's Board of Appeals or Board of Adjustment. They're an alternate and they've attended one meeting because they don't get to participate. Okay. And we currently, excuse me, only have one alternate because was it HPB, we had a resignation and the board, we, we didn't fill the alternate the, position, right? Or we have no alternate on HPB or Planning Commission right now. Due to resignations? Uh, right. Okay. Um, we moved people up. Um, and so it's either Board of Appeals or Board of Adjustment. We have an alternate left on one of those okay. boards. Okay. So we're, we're kind of talking about, there's two topics to this part here, is alternates um, and then the number. I mean, does anyone else have anything on alternates? I, I'm sensing, I see at least three of us said no need for alternates. I don't know if there's any other. Well, as somebody who applied to a board and wasn't accepted, <laughs> I would have taken an alternate position. So I don't want to phase out if we have enthusiasm and, you know, uh, Councilmember Barr, or uh, Mayor Pro Tem Barr, to your point, um, <laughs> where you can say they can still participate in the meetings, I don't think it's the same. I don't think it's the same level of investment than giving some sort of title and an investment in that role. Um, so I don't want to dissuade folks, but, but I'm very movable on this, and if the rest of the council feels that we want to eliminate alternates, I was persuaded last year to keep them, but we can, um, if it's a challenge and the attendance is really showing up and it is creating more of an administrative um, difficulty, I can move toward no alternates. As someone who was an alternate and didn't stay. <laughs> <laughs> the failure. We're both here. It just wasn't, it was also COVID and everything was Zoom and it wasn't fun and I didn't feel like I knew what I could do or participate. So as someone who came in rearing to go, I felt kind of, disappointed. I would rather be in and have more buy-in from the get-go. Okay, well there's four and a half that are kind of uh, <laughs> on that, so it seems like we're leaning towards no alternates. How about membership size? This one's a little, I'm torn with membership size because I think, uh, you know, especially for the, the, the quasi and legislative ones, I think keeping it at seven is hard, but then we have license authority is do we, it's five, um, and election commission is uh, Election commission is, is five, five. Uh, board of appeals, board of adjustment, and licensing are five. Um, and then planning commission and HPB are seven. And, I mean, I'm kind of torn on this too because I, I'm not set on seven's not a, some magic number. Um, even so, some of the advisory uh, boards, I mean, the reason when we set up uh, Next Gen is we said, you know, let's see how, we didn't know what the uh, um, um, interest would be, so let's set it up so that we could have a floating number there. And, you know, int and I think um, some of the, it, ESC is a larger group too, isn't it? I'm trying to think, what is? ESC is the seven. seven. Okay, well, Transportation Mobility Board, is, that's the larger board, isn't it? What, we have two that are larger than seven, I thought. 
Colleen, what's the rationale for the five? I mean, five seems plenty for those boards, but maybe I'm missing something. Mm -hmm. um, as those numbers were set before I came in, um, I do know with one of the boards, uh, there's a statutory requirement that we have it. Is that the Board of Adjustment or Board of Appeals, Reed? A board of adjustment and state statute says at least five members. So it could be. And seven. so that's probably where they. It, it seems to me the five board. and the seven for the appropriate boards work, and why should we change it? Next gen, we increased it really high because we we just wanted to get more people, and maybe the fifteen looks like too many vacancies, and, and I'd be willing to pull it down to seven <clears throat> and make it look more exclusive or whatever. But other than that, the five and seven. Five is too low for that, I think. Well, I think for the, some of the, the boards with their advisory, even having more voices in that, um, because some of the commissions are licensing authority would be a commission because they're quasi. Um, and then so with the board of, did you say adjustment? Whatever board you said um, no. that would be. <laughs> Does I would support leaving it the way it is with the exception of next gen and pulling that down to seven. Mm -hmm. That works for me. And was there, is there any other one? Am I misremembering? There's another one that's larger than seven? Arts and Culture Commission is at 11. Maybe that's what it was. And then uh, Capital Improvement Sales Tax Citizen Committee, Malfoy is at eight. Oh, on that, well, that's. Yeah, that's two citizens and then uh, board chairs. So I don't think we're going to have consistency on the size. <laughs> I think that's fine. I, that's and I fine. think that it's so, so, your choice to make. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the the two that were called out that that uh, we that may be worth your guidance here would be the NGAC and the Arts and Cultural. I, I, if we if we standardize on seven both those, it would make it more efficient to administratively support those those two boards and recruit as well. And recruit. I just want to get input from the heads of those two boards to see how that's going to affect what their view on that. Because I actually don't know from JD and Kate what their opinion, and I would want to know their opinion. And I'm happy to reach out and ask them. So what are you saying? Arts and culture, you want to make it smaller and you see smaller? I'd like guidance from you. It's not, yeah. not so much what I want, but, but it would be nice to have guidance in this area from, from, from you. <laughs> that's on, what he was talking about, a few of them yeah, that were mentioned. It, and I th it, it seems to me, and, and uh, uh, Gretchen has a point, but you want, in some of those, you want more people. Right. And so the 11 and the 8 make sense there, too. Especially pending another consideration about a, a, a consolidation yeah, that might, might make sense. This might be the time to keep arts and culture at 11. Well, I'm, I'm not going to be an advocate of arts and culture combining with fine arts, because fine arts is a doing board. They hang art. The arts and culture is a strategic board that um, I mean, I know I'm jumping ahead, I, but... I, I don't mean to, to move you forward in the, the All right, well, I'll wait. That, he was just saying the, the number would be maybe um, a result of a conversation later. Uh, Andrea and I talked to J.D. and Kate and get their recommendation to weigh in on how that would affect them. And we can bring that back to this council. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, if you can just follow up with staff and have staff send an email um, so we can provide so some got more guidance. So just clear then... Um, if you know, is there a consensus to move toward something other in arts and culture? Um, if the, the chairs... let's have that, let's have we can. I, I think right. I'm right now is leaving the numbers almost as is. Um, with with I bet I don't. I mean, the only one I heard to say change would be next gen, and I'm actually fine leaving next gen as is. But if we had it for seven, I think leaving the numbers right now. But you know, maybe looking at next gen and keeping it yeah. seven. But the other ones, I don't think we need to touch right now. I don't see any value in consistency for consistency's sake in this one. I think the value is, is, the, is, the, is the ABC functioning at its current, functioning well at its current level. Um, and and if, it, if it's not functioning, then we should address it. But if it's functioning, um, and I agree with Gretchen that the leadership of the committees have, will have more insight than I will, which is a pretty low bar, but I'm confident so they I'm can seeing some head nods around keeping the numbers as, as they are. Well, and, and, and you, we can come back and revisit with you. Getting the guidance on the alternates is helpful, and we can come back if we need to on membership 
future okay. guidance. Thanks. Uh, next up, we have officer positions and roles. So currently uh, in the Littleton Charter, it only mentions the chair and vice chair roles. Um, some ABCs have secretaries. Um, council, uh, council secretary is the city clerk. Um, and then for uh, quasi-judicials, they also have a, a, a wonderful member of the city clerk. Um, so for the, the handful that have secretaries on advisory boards, um, it's a little bit redundant because minutes are often held staff are inputting those minutes um, anyway after the fact. Um, and so it's potentially not necessary to have a secretary for advisory boards and for quasi-judicial that function is fulfilled by the city clerk's office. Um, so it, it would be up to you if, if secretary is a role that we want uh, to continue to have or if it's something that is has less of a function. I'm, you know, I think it makes sense to get rid of it, but I also think it is two slides from now when we talk about reporting that might have to um, have a conversation about what that looks like with that, so. Okay. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. The chair, and vice chair. The, the chair and vice chair make sense. It's just the secretary is the only one. Correct. And that has, a, a, that will be kind of decided once we talk about the minutes. Yeah, I think okay. that would be a good place to have that. So, we sounds good. talk about for reporting, yep. Thanks. Um, so for terms and term limits, uh, they are, are fairly consistent. Um, our, the code sets most of them um, at uh, three terms with uh, three three-year terms. So um, it, it would be possible to just extend this to, to all. Um, in looking at the chart, the only uh, difference in this is the capital improvement sales tax citizen committee, which is at two years, and then NGAC has some specific um, requirements for students uh, and then uh, others. So those, that's the only variance. Yeah, I think at least with those two specific ones that was made specific just because of the unique nature of them. Um, and so everything else is three years and the authorities are separate. We don't, uh, those, are, those are in statute, so we don't, can't really touch that at all, so. I was going to say, um, we can approach the question about next gen when we get there too, but um, I will, I'll say that, yeah, we can't do, really do anything about the uh, sales tax committee at, at all, right? I mean, that's not something oh, we, we could. Have, that's something we could do. We, do we have we control over that? Or, I mean, we said that. Yeah, we created that. Okay. We could, I mean, we could say it's two people and they have lifetime appointments if we <laughs> wanted to. I, yeah, I mean, I thought there was uh, some sort of limitation we had placed on it anyway, so. I, I don't see the need to extend that to three years. No, I think, I mean, it, it's already consistent amongst the ones. I don't think we need to change that, unless anyone else has any thoughts on. So leave term limits the, the way they are today. The, the only thing is it's, it's odd that it's three three-year terms where, you know, council is, what, three, four-year, up to three, four-year terms. I guess there's no two-year term anymore. So um, it's just, the, I'm, it's, there's no reason to be consistent just for consistency's sake. So I think having the three years is, is fine. Thank you. No change. Um, all right, so now to reporting, uh, so we can revive the conversation about secretaries in this portion if you would like. Um, in prior to uh, earlier this year, in 2023, there was uh, no formal reporting structure among ABCs. Um, earlier this year, council um, implemented a uh, uh, a structure in which um, each ABC was assigned, uh, all ABCs had a a semi-annual written narrative that they would uh, provide to council, and then ABCs were assigned either a joint meeting um, with the chair and vice chair or uh, a scheduled appearance. Uh, and so if council is, is satisfied with that reporting structure, we can continue uh, and move forward with that as, as is, or if there's anything you'd like to change. And as far as um, who is providing the, if, if you'd like to chat about who's providing uh, the written narrative, we could, we could address that as well if that's, uh, where secretaries find their role. So I think this is kind of one of the more meaty topics of uh, reporting and minutes. You know, obviously the, the legislative quasi ones have their videotape, they have full on minutes. Um, I think it's some of the advisory boards. Um, how, I think it's two things, one, the, public record for what they're what they're conducting and also to to report back to council kind of hey the, you know they're created council created them to do a reason to, something that we don't want to have to do otherwise you know we could be 
full-time um, legislators and doing all these things, um, but it's kind of offloading some of the work um, to have those, those bodies there. I, you know, having, and this has been a discussion for, for years since I was on Lyft about, you know, is it action minutes, is it full-on verbatim um, minutes, um, and how, how we get to that. So I think this kind of ties in, do we need to have, what does the reporting look like back from them? Does it, does it have to be minutes of the meeting? Can it be, um, could it be more on the council liaison, especially for these boards? And that's kind of what I was thinking is like, you know, if we make sure that we have a council liaison attend, attend these meetings to report back to council, hey, ABC, ABC one, two, three talked about this and this is what they're talking about. And uh, does council have any, you know, during our comments and reports, we can, you know, talk back to our council members and say, oh, you know, let's, maybe we should send them this, this direction here. Um, so I wanna hear what you all have to say about what the reporting looks like. It's a test to the agenda. Call, Colleen's direction on this a little bit, um, she has opinion. Does Colleen have an opinion? <laughs> what, like you've met me? Um, so I, in my opinion, um, as we know, council has adopted action minutes, right, um, with the video as a backup. Um, according to Robert's Rules of Orders, minutes are for motions made and action taken only. And our advisory boards are not taking any action. Um, they, in essence, operate like council does in a study session. And we stopped doing minutes or summary notes for study sessions for council about seven years ago. Um, and I think if there were a reporting mechanism from the liaison to council um, where that document could be made public, that, that this is what they are working on, this is the status, these are next steps. Um, because really all we're capturing right now is attendance and adjournment, because there's nothing else that they're doing. Um, and yet it's an investment of nothing staff time. Nothing else actionable, they're, they're doing stuff. They're do else, yeah. Right, there's nothing we are doing as the clerk or the secretary. Um, and so to, to keep um, actual quote unquote minutes for bodies that are not taking action, they are not making motions, they're operating largely by consensus um, to move forward. Um, in my opinion, we keep it the way it is for our quasis, right? Because we have to track those motions, amendments, votes, things like that. Um, but for advisory boards and for um, committees, um, if we have a reporting mechanism in place to get that information to council, then it, it seems a, a, a bit of a waste to have a, a secretary creating minutes that aren't actually minutes. So what would the opposite argument be? Transparency purposes? What's the transparency? It's, it's a roll call and an adjournment, because there Just is- Just the discussion or the topics or what? But we don't capture those- it's an agenda. Yeah. We don't capture those in our, we don't do summary minutes. Exactly. Yeah, the opposite would be like the outcome. If they're talking about, if, if Next Gen was talking about, let's say they were talking about the safe parking initiative and, you know, without having a report back, when, you know, they gave us a report, um, you know, theoretically, no one could have known what they talked about at that meeting if there was But they no. wouldn't anyway is what she's saying. Well, Except for the agenda with, which already exists. Okay. But with what they talked about, but the outcome of, you know, maybe they said, oh, we don't want to do this, or they said they recommend it. So it's, you know, that's where the, the idea of having a board member secretary that would take notes could theoretically fill that. However, that's a slippery slope because, you know, I've been on boards where the mindset was not what council had said. This is action minutes. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot of um, opinions inserted in there when it's not just the report from um, the board. Does every board have staff support and could staff um, t you know, take a very brief summary without being a burden to say, hey, they talked about this, it seemed like they were uh, you know, interested in doing this? I, you know, I'm trying if, there's, if the chair brings it to the uh, conclusion of, you know, we're gonna recommend, this is a, a direction we think we should go, um, yes. You know, I think if it's just they talked about this 
this topic and didn't have any consensus, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's we would want to mm -hmm. capture what their direction, which way they are going, if they have one. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm going to make Colleen's head explode. I'm thinking more like the liquor advisory group, you know, when they have their discussions and have a report of, you know, what they discussed, whether it was consensus or not, and, you know, so-and-so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, trying to figure out, you know, or if it's not staff making a, a written, you know, is there a way to record something so theoretically the public could go watch the discussion that they have? I, yes, I think we're, that would be possible. we're combining reporting right. with minutes. We are, and we're, we're well, trying to keep up with you a, a, a little bit. I think we've, we've moved to the minutes component of reporting. I did. I, can did, I, I did jump. That's my, that's my fault. Can I go back to the reporting piece? Uh, um, Mr. Mayor. I, <laughs> I, I, yeah, because the minutes is a whole different thing. I think we need to hear from our boards and commissions on an aggregate level, not detailed. Nobody's going to read the detailed minutes. For transparency, that's another issue. But what I would like to see is communication with the boards and two-way communication with the, those boards that it makes sense, like Planning Commission, we have joint meetings when we need joint meetings. With HPB, I'd like to see them come once a year and have interaction. This is what we're working on. This is what I would like, it, council would like you, them to work on. Others are just very reactive. And I would also like to, I'm gonna go down a bunny trail here, like to see HPB be able to discuss projects and not um, be restricted by open meetings law. Um, I think now you're going to make Reed's head explode. I was, I was looking for it, that table that you put in there with the uh, uh, reporting, which is... I right, that's what yet. we're trying to bring yeah, up. Yeah, I know. I, I got everyone off topic, so um, sorry. Yeah, uh, okay. so what I would like, and, and I would like a schedule, and I, I always have advocated this. I'll get off that HPB thing for a second. So we've got this many meetings, and at the beginning of an appropriate study session or whatever, we meet with the relevant boards... And we know what that's going to be throughout the year. And they know in September, HPV knows they're going to come before council, talk about their projects, get their feedback. Not everybody, each board needs to come and make a presentation unless we want to learn about them. And then we just, where appropriate, we have biannual uh, reports from them that just, you know, like a three quarters of a page email highlight what they're working on. I think, it, I think a lot of what you're saying is included in the communication framework that council adopted six months or, or, ago or so. So we're trying to bring that up. It's in oh, your packet. Okay. You're trying to bring up that table that, that has table the semi-annual written narrative, the yes. joint meeting, and yeah, the city uh, session. Uh, yeah. Which one was that in? It's, uh, it's in the memo. Oh, it's in oh the, memo. Uh, the spreadsheet? No. no. It's no. Also, it's also the staff communication? It's, it's a lot, yeah, it's a lot simpler to see it in that one page. Yeah, I, I to kind of... Uh, Oh, yeah. Add on to what Council Member Grove was saying. Um, yeah, I think the way that we have it structured in which we have two concrete deliverables at mid and end points and a joint study session scheduled at least one appearance from each of the ABCs per year um, makes sense. The only challenge here is obviously timing. Um, you know, our study sessions, our work is, is quite full. So it's really mat a matter of being able to sync up these groups with the timing of something productive. I, I honestly would rather not hear from someone if they're just giving me a status update, but rather to have an involved discussion about a particular topic. So that could, that could be, you know, upon appointment, we front load our year with ABC meetings to help set and guide, set guidance and direction, or we kind of see them mostly towards the end of their sessions to receive the feedback from what they have done directly and, and provide comment. But I, I don't feel like I need a presentation for the sake of a presentation. The written format can suffice for giving status updates. But I think more importantly in that joint study session, it needs to be a discussion where we're either providing feedback or giving direction in some form to that ABC. So that's my only ask. Um, the meeting minutes uh, question. Yeah, um, I would say for the advisory boards, yeah, just not really necessary. Um, I think it is, I think it's council's role, quite honestly, if we are attending, I mean, I try 
as much as I can to attend as many as I can. Um, staff, I know, does, an, uh, does a great job. I think that is sufficient for report out purposes that the staff liaison um, provide a short summary uh, to the respective council member and the council member can make co public comment and make that put that into the public record. But the specificity of the kinds and types and detail of those meeting minutes, um, quite honestly, is it, it, you're, you're kind of chasing something that's just not really relevant. So I'm still hearing minutes and reporting. Sorry. Can I suggest we spend a minute on yeah. the reporting? This is what council approved and what we've been working on for the past six months or so, where you have um, a handful of your board's commissions that have joint meetings. And then you have the others, the balance of them, have a scheduled appearance to just share what they've been, been working on, check in with you, and then at that point, and I, I heard a, a, a little something different from Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Barr just now, but we had said that we'd like every six months to have the written update. So no, I, I would agree with that. But are we getting them? I, I don't. Yeah, get, we're, we're, we're still practicing that. <laughs> working I mean, we it. get some, we get it's TMP. Not, and it's been about <laughs> six months now since you adopted this, so we're working with the, the advisories and the, the others to have those uh, we need to develop that discipline I'm, I'm realizing a cadence? a cadence on when to expect them that's standardized mm -hmm. in other words at the end you know I think it would be if they take their seats in April we would plan for six months which is about October okay that that would be good and and we also don't want it all at once well, necessarily with the, with the written reports the written we can have all at once have, but the saying, yeah the meetings months. yeah yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and um and it's nothing to say that it can't, you know, I think some of them, like ESC or NextGen or TMB, might have more written reports that say, hey, we talked about, right. um, you know, bike safety. This is, we have this recommendation that we don't want to do. Th this is a floor. This is a minimum. Uh, you know, we certainly can go beyond this. But so the, the concept of the written narrative would be one written narrative that gave you an overview report about all of the different ABCs included in the one narrative. So if there was more in-depth narratives from a board or ABC, they would be separate from that six month. So the six month would be one consolidated. Here's what they've been working on. Here's, you know, those kind of things. And we would give the chance for the, 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 the ABC chair, vice chair, the, 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 them to just, you know, review what was being reported for them. Um, but that, that was the concept kind of, you know, to, to, to get on a regular reporting to council so you had something about every one of your ABCs. Robert. Um, so uh, in my prior role, all the advisory boards presented annually on what they had done and we revisited their charge during that conversation. And that seemed to work really well for me. And I, I think we need to take a step back and talk a little bit about what, what we're trying to accomplish with these boards and commissions. And so in my mind, boards and commissions are often a communication tool for us to hear about what the community thinks is going on. And so, and, and for us to ask them to address specific questions that we think are important. And, and that was the revisiting of the charge every year. And I think that works for the advisory boards. Advisory boards. But, but almost all of them are advisory boards, right? Well, we have a lot of legislative quasi-boards that, you know, are... Legislatives are reactive. Okay. They get an application. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. Yeah. rule on but, the application. Yeah. So... Um, I think there should be regular communication. If so, if they're if they're reactive, if they're legislative, then they have minutes because they're making a decision. Correct. And if they're only advisory, they should the the chair and the vice chair should carry the water for telling us what they did that was important or what they think is important, and that should be in either their semi-annual report or their annual presentation. The, if, if that's and, and that's how they memorialize what they think they did that's valuable and and the liaison's job is to um, communicate to them what we think as a as a council is important for them to be talking about and say 
we would really appreciate you to engage in this issue. And also, if there's something that's going on that's immediate, like we're really focused on this one problem in this one place, then they, the liaison has a job to report back to us about what those immediate concerns are. But most of it's, you know, it's just operation. The meeting happened, the people are doing what they need to do. So, um, so I guess, all right, so first of all, if it's advisory, no minutes. That, I don't agree with that. And I, I agree 100% that there should at least be annual written, annual kind of conversations around what they're doing and revisiting, you know, are they doing the things that we think are important or, or that they think are important and just kind of as a check, as, as a check in. I'm not sure twice a year, I, what, if it's the report you're imagining, that's like a paragraph mm -hmm. in a five page document. It could be. That, Mm -hmm. Depends on the uh, the, the body. Yeah. And right. that would in the author, yeah. And that would assume probably that kind of one summary would assume staff assistance with kind of drafting. Here's what the meetings have been about. Here's what we've been been talking about. And then collaborating with the chair and the vice chair, uh, you know, to make sure that that's what they'd like to to communicate. But yeah, I feel like that. That's the, if the vice chair and chair don't think their meetings are important enough to write down, and like a sentence, we did these three things, then why in the world are they there? Yeah, I don't think we'll have a problem. I think you're right. Yeah. So, I, I mean, if they're not, if it's not important enough to write the three sentences of this is what I wish the council would know, then maybe we need to revisit whether yeah. our, our help will just be putting it together into one. You yeah, you got to you got to prepare yeah. the presentation for and the schedule board. if it's if it's a, a study session, which would be a little more in depth conversation versus schedule appearance. You know, I think some of them might just hey come down here for five minutes and say this is what well, we did, and council's like. And so, so Mayor, to that point, I, I wasn't here when you guys decided which ones were going to be joint meetings and which ones were going to be scheduled appearances. Um, it, it, so, I, I, in my mind, it's somewhat arbitrary which ones are, are each. And, and uh, from a flexibility, a scheduling flexibility point of view, the study session or scheduled appearance is much more flexible for us, right? Um, and then also some of the feedback received from some of the ABC members was, was do I really need to go to that? <laughs> you know, when it was the joint session, it was like, well, it's, you are invited. It's a joint session for your entire board. And they're like, oh, okay. You know, like, and, and sometimes it's the same week that they have their meeting, so it's the second night. So. Um, I guess I just would ask you to intentionally decide if a joint meeting is your best your best option. And if it is, great. But if, if you're not seeing a, a big difference, the study session or scheduled appearance would provide more flexibility. In that case, instead of having the whole body, you would just have their, their, their chair and their vice chair um, along with the liaison to, to report. Yeah, I'm, I'm used to the, the chair and vice chair making the presentation. And it's important that they... And, it's important that, I mean, there, I, in my mind, the other thing is honoring these people's work and the time they're doing. And so you, I, we want to make sure there, it happens at least once a year that they are able to present out the, the work that they're doing. Well, I mean, does anyone have any, I mean, I think this table looks good. So leave it? I think so, unless there's any strong. Well, I, I feel like Mike, sorry, just ask for more flexibility. I, I just brought it up, but we're fine sticking with it. That's what your guidance is. Well, what, so what more flexibility would, I mean. So it, does the joint meeting add value for you as a council? And if it does, great. But if it doesn't, if there was, if there was not significant benefit, for you, benefit, then we could I, go to just the scheduled appearance or study session. I think a joint meeting typically is a joint study session. Mm -hmm. So I'm, yeah, that's, I'm fine with, yeah, because. Yeah, and you like having the entire body there as opposed to just the chair and the vice chair. I that's the difference, yeah. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think it's up to the, to the body. So they, right now it's not. We we tell them that you dictate, and so their whole body is invited. I would think for. I'm just throwing this out here for contemplation. Would there be a better reason to say quasi-judicial um, uh, bodies would be in a joint meeting scenario, and advisory boards can choose to elect either chair have that flexibility? Would that be? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's fine, but like if you recall back to the Arts and Culture Commission when they were all here and you had the you know the big room, yeah. was that valuable to have them all here for you? I think it was valuable for them. I think that's yeah. what they said. So. I mean, again, it's like a floor, not a ceiling, right? So right. Yeah. the invitation is open. And even but. you know, I, the licensing authority, we don't need to have the entire licensing <laughs> yeah. commission there. We really don't. Same with board of Same with board appeals, adjustment so. or 
you know, building So it's not as black and white as the legislative and yeah, board. Yeah, you're so. right. It's maybe not that. So I think, yeah, flexibility. I'm fine with the flexibility. Yeah. Too. And we can, I think we're hearing that message. So I think we can keep joint meetings, certainly with your, your quasis, and then we'll be sensitive to the entire board's interest in a joint meeting versus the chair um, and vice chair. And like Council or Mayor Pro Tem said, it's a floor. If they if they find value of it, you know we can, they all can come. You know you know there's no one. So we, we can, we're not going to haul anyone in here. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Mayor. I'm going to get the Councilmember Grove. Um, okay, so we have one board, HPB, that is judicial and advisory, and uh, they have traditionally worked on projects like mid-mod mile and things like this. And I would like to get them back working on those proactive projects. Can we do that? Yeah, Is there we any can, problem? That's, yes, can, there is, and it's, it's we, not gonna keep them out of open meeting laws. They, I mean, you know, we'd have right. discussions that are that esoteric. That be the characterization you intended by saying that they wouldn't be subject to open, to open meeting laws a moment ago. You're, you're right. I um, you're wanting even more flexibility for that board to take on projects, even given that we have a framework that we've also adopted for that for those groups, um, that's a little that it has some more structure to it. Where they th is that accurate? I don't mean to. They right. have to adhere to open meetings law because they're quasi judicial. No. Not more no, than two. that's not why. It's because they're a government body. It has nothing to do with being quasi judicial. It's a, okay. So they have to. What I want to get back on the calendar, on the agenda, is allowing them to talk about projects in their meetings. So, okay. So that therein lies a, a concern with the open meetings law and a violation of open meetings law. Same reason that council doesn't start commenting about things that are heard during public comment is because you have to set forth an agenda and that agenda has to be as specific as you can be in terms of the projects or what is going to be discussed. That's what the law says. So one of the quote unquote guardrails that we put in place um, for HPB specifically to allow for HPB and even planning commission to a lesser extent but is we, we put in kind of those guardrails where we can start tapping into that knowledge, but yet constraining them into the boundaries of the law. And that was, we had decided, and I believe the, the missive went out saying, you know, a couple times a year, uh, we're gonna meet. And I think they were called workshops. I'm not sure officially what HPB called it. And it was supposed to be, sorry? No problem. Oh. A study session? Yeah, a study session. Kind, kind of a study session. Where they session. plan their work. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and can and we do that again? That's what they that's, currently that's are the doing. That's the program that's in place now, where they have a couple times a year, they talk about the projects in which they would like to But they engage. haven't been able to do that, and I want to get them to be able well, to do that. If, if that's a feeling, they should be have in that, they should have that opportunity to plan projects that they want to do, have a little little back and forth with with staff and the city manager and the mayor to make sure that we're, those projects are in, are in line with uh, council's interests and, and staff capacity, really. Um, and then once we've all said, yep, these are gonna be projects we're, we're gonna work on, they can schedule on their agenda, to, to Reed's point, um, those study sessions to move those projects forward. So that's how, that's how that's supposed to work now. And if I'm hearing that you might be hearing that it's not working that way, then we can double back and And so we can happen. make that happen. So we can have a study session on the projects. They can come to us, at, and right now I'm the liaison. I don't know if I'm, how liaison's gonna work, but I can come back and say, here's the projects, or they can make a presentation. It's Council can go yes or no, and simpler then- simpler than that. Oh, great, and but we can start, to, so we can have that study session then, for them to do they their projects. They can have projects. a study session, okay. yes. Thank you, Yep. I will let them know. And I have a note to help make that happen, so. All right, so um, we're good on reporting, I think. Um, minutes, I heard no, no, no minutes, no, advisory, no minutes. Um, that's what I'm, so there's a, okay. 
so there, glad we had that conversation ahead of time. <laughs> uh, what are we on, hybrid attendance, is that where we are? Yes. Yes. Can, can uh, this, is, this was a request, was this a request from NextGen? TMB. Um, TMB about joining hybrid. Um, for members. For, also, for members. Also NextGen. Also, been for also uh, NextGen. Um, the issue this is for, for just, hybr or for advisory is because there are legal issues, liability with uh, quasi-judicial joining a hybrid that, you know, they're not paying attention, they were doing something else, that, you know, who knows what they were, they could have been reading a bunch of stuff. I mean, well, I guess we have a computer here too, but you know. Um, so for advisory, can they, do we want to allow them to join a hybrid because it would be more flexible for them to, to join is what they yes. are asking. I don't buy the idea that hybrid, I mean, they're bored or they're bored. If they're bored, they're bored. It doesn't matter whether they're hybrid or they're. I mean, are you okay with them joining? Yeah, okay. I mean, I sorry, that was way too long. Issue, yeah. That wasn't boredom for the quasi, that was more. You know, I know, I know we got used to it during um, the pandemic, but I think if we have to meet in person and if they can't meet in person, I, I think they should make the commitment to meet in person. And I understand people have um, obligations and sometimes it's not so easy, but the conversation when you're together in person is richer than when you're hybrid. Hybrid's just awkward, and that's my opinion. I just have a question for staff. What, what would be the um, impact on staff of allowing hybrid meetings this way? I mean, it would, if they're, would we have to allow the public to join hybrid then, and then are we broadcasting it, and how does that's, that? That's two different things, and that would be council's decision. Um, but we would have to rely on staff there at the meeting to manage the Zoom meeting and all of those things. So that's extra added capacity for staff. Um, right. Um, and would we, I guess that would be for us to decide, would have to be a reporting, like, hey, you know, 24 hours or 40 hours ahead of time, I need to join by Zoom versus if, we're gonna have staff there to set up Zoom and everyone shows up in person, there's kind of a not the best use of staff. Yeah, so in terms of the notification requirements, if it was gonna be all online, um, you know, we need to let the public know generally 24 hours in advance if they're gonna show up here and there's not gonna be anyone here. Um, you know, in terms of kind of the administrative side of it from the city side, I mean, I I would encourage council to set some expectation that there will be, a, at least at this point, a physical meeting presence and then allow, if you're inclined to, to allow some hybrid participation by board members, that's the first topic, um, you know, we could probably facilitate that, you know, like we do, we, we have the big screen in the a community room and. I, th I don't think that adds a lot more. Um, so I think it does change the field dramatically if we have boards starting to meet entirely. That's harder to manage if, if they're entirely remote. Um, then we have to, then there is more. Does, does anyone want to have an entire remote meeting? No. I, I, I can imagine a, a, a chair coming to us and saying, because of this special circumstance, we want to do something entirely remote. But I think it's up to the chair and the, and the vice chair. To that does take some different notification. And it's technically up to you. Why do we I think we need to have some consistency so they know whether or not just like a free fall and just let yeah. them decide. Yeah, um, in person. That's how it's been. We, we lay out the schedule ahead of time. Uh, less staff time, uh, I, I would think. Um, I think, to Pam's point, I just think you get more energy, more input when it's in person. I would be in favor of like what you were clarifying is to have flexibility. I think we want more people involved, more young people involved, right? So if my travel schedule or for work, it would be nice to have the option to, for one person, when they have to, to be hybrid. But I think an expectation that we're in person and that it's consistently that way. So to have a quorum in person and if others. Although for advisory, a quorum wouldn't be 
Right. So I, 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 I was, have flexibility, but everybody lives in Littleton or works here. We're 15 minutes away from the city center. The, there, I, I, hold. There are so many circumstances that can prevent someone even traveling 15 minutes. I just want to say, Dr. Cog also just adopted a hybridized meeting request, as in board members can individually request of the chair. And uh, you know, up to a certain amount of time ahead of schedule to ha be able to participate in, in a hybrid format. Honestly, that's going to hugely increase the participation rate at these Dr. Car Dr. Cog meetings by like a significant margin. And I know Dr. Cog is with, in a larger group, but there are so many people that can't make that distance because something came up. They're actually you know living life or working a job in the evening yeah like but that's it's greater they're greater distance that's a very regional thing this is very local and i was on the dr cog when they went to the hybrid meetings people turn off their um cameras you can't see who's who there was a lack of discussion it, it didn't work i mean in, in my opinion okay. and i couldn't see who was who and the discussion was very very limited and that that's my opinion i well, to speed things along, I think having, we don't need to flesh out the details of how it works, but I think having the option um, for hybrid um, would help um, with attendance and quorum and everything. And I think I see five people nodding their head for that, so. Thank you. Advisory? And advisory only, yeah, Thank advisory. You. Next Great. one is. Thank you. On. Now, uh, we get to hybrid participation for members of the public. This one is a, a little bit more difficult currently, um, but staff will be exploring in 2024 for um, options to have council meetings uh, with hybrid participation from from um, the community. Uh, so I think as we explore that with council, it could be possible that we bring that back and uh, have an option for um, advisory boards or quasi-judicial, the way you feel, maybe not quasi-judicial, um, looking at Reed. Uh, but this would be something that we're happy to bring back to council. At this time, it would be a little bit more difficult um, to accomplish, given that we're not currently doing that with, with city council. A little, little more context. Council's talked about this, and you had you actually had thought you'd, you'd like to do some piloting of this, and we're working on, we, we want to we want to bring that to you. There, there are more staffing implications, because effectively, and Colleen can jump in if I say this wrong, it does take a, a person to manage the online world when you have a hybrid meeting and our clerks are also focused on running the meeting i would want to check back in with council on this topic especially as we've heard um, more and more abusive uh, situations in some of the cities around us um, where it's it's actually made those communities rethink their their interest in uh, hybrid participation by the public unfortunately um, just with very disruptive behavior um, and I don't know that they ha they've had more of their own public participating, but they have had the negative experiences that have gotten quite serious and severe. So I would want, you know, council's thought on, on that. If council's still interested in experimenting, piloting something like this, you know, we want to we want to dig in on that in the next next few few months and kind of clarify. Is this how. slide specific for ABCs, right? Because that's what the discussion. Is. It is, but it's based off of the discussion that we were having so with you. I would say, let's pause this for ABCs right now until we even have something that we can work on with council to see if it's if it's feasible and, and makes sense. Agreed. I don't want to jump over and do that. So, great, thank you. Next slide. Uh, our media slide. <laughs> so we, this is I think one of the, the biggest topics council wanted to, to cover. Um, we have some, uh, we could take these in parts. So first we have uh, the possibility to merge the, both the Fine Arts Board and the Arts and Culture Commission. Um, in our research they, they overlap um, in, quite a few, in quite a few ways and both would still be able to fulfill all of their functions if they were um, a, a merged board. And that is something that has been discussed with the chairs of, the, of those boards. Yeah, and the council discussed that. So yeah. I, you know, I know Councilmember Grove brought it up before. I think they're so closely aligned having two boards that are dealing with um, arts is um, re redundant almost. And so I'm in favor of merging um, fine arts and arts and culture to one. Thank you. I see three, four. So, so who's going to hang the art? The new, the new board is they would have a subcommittee 
and that subcommittee of would decide on the content and those would be made up of, of experts okay And I'm going to ask about this art again. Didn't it trade it out? <laughs> I think they heard you loud and clear, Councilmember. <laughs> so we got a uh, possible transition from a couple of these to hearing officers, what uh, Board of Appeals and or licensing. To specifically, um, the hearing officer would be an associate judge with the municipal court, and that's already been discussed, and it's uh, absolutely a possibility. So um, largely what these boards are doing is um, administrative uh, in nature, and Colleen can speak to this more. Um, we do feel that there's um, some value in still having the licensing authority. Um, they are uh, a really wonderful functioning board, um, but it's possible for uh, BBOA to be uh, managed by a hearing officer. I, yeah. I want to keep the licensing commission. Yes. <laughs> yes. I appreciate that you're already invested in using them. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I think I would rather almost combine the BB, BBOA and the BOA um, into one, not necessarily go to a hearing officer if that's feasible. But uh, I agree. So I, I do think there's a value to having the community involved with some of those decisions that affect, you know, so not necessarily going straight to a hearing officer. <laughs> he wasn't. I guess it would be the B B B O C. Yeah, B C O A C. B B A C. Somewhere there's a C. Um, I'm just gonna take chart. ABCs that could sunset. Existing ABCs that could sunset here. Where am I looking at here? Do we have anything listed there specifically? No, we don't have any suggestions. That's That's just yeah. I, if we're having an annual conversation about their charge. That's when that would come up. Like, we don't have a charge for you. And I think that that would be um, largely committees, right, that are appointed for a specific purpose, potentially for a specific period of time, at which point they could either be sunsetted or continued if there were. Which um, was part of the conversation with both NextGen and the ESC. And I think maybe 1030 at night is not the best time <laughs> to decide to right. get rid of one. So work through the next year when we go through these charges might yep. make sense there. Sounds good. And then I'll take the next one because it is late. Um, it's I guess without even even asking for the in, for the input tonight, we've heard a lot of um, interest from a couple of your your bodies, the uh, NGAC, um, ESC to some extent, mm -hmm. and TMB, to work more flexibly. I think to put it, you know, I think some of this is is generational. <coughs> trying to you know keep folks folks involved kind of pursuant to the um, hybrid participation topic that we had um, and there's actually a, a lot of a, a lot of pushback I'll say um, from a couple of from N, from NGAC mostly give them credit for leading the charge but I, I think it's, it's something we're gonna have to deal with as a local government all local government all governments gonna have to deal with this um, how do we get folks involved who work just differently than when the Open Meetings Act um, was was established? We have boards, you know, NGAC really genuinely believes that they would be more productive for the city if they could work via social media. Um, you know, if they could work via via social media, if they could meet more spontaneously at a coffee shop. Um, if they, you know, didn't, if all of the, those things. So, so staff has been, has been thinking and we're still thinking about how could we still keep the city in compliance with the, with the uh, open meetings um, law and give council some options on how to structure these advisory boards, not the quasi-judicial boards, in a way that we think we can keep, you know, long-term interest, activity, engagement, um, as these new work style demands just, you know, uh, become more and more the norm. So, so I'll say you want to maybe keep thinking and come back when yeah. there's some more things that have been thought out yes. um, of ways that you, because so I, I think it's important we figure out how we can be more flexible, but not necessarily come up with this is how we're going to be prescriptive tonight and how to do it. M mostly we want to know if, if it's a hard no. You're like, leave them alone the way it is, or yes, if it's you're okay open to, to this. I'm open to it. 
open to open it. Open to it. No. Open. Open. Whatever. Okay, I think there was the, the opens have it. I, I I think as long as we post and that members of the uh, public could attend and be transparent. I mean, I, I don't know about the social media stuff. And yeah, I, I, and I don't think that's what we're talking about. Um, it's to be more spontaneous, which wouldn't necessarily give us that, the yeah. 24 hours to post. Currently, Government is that's nothing part of if the, not spontaneous. The problem. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot more to this, but we wanted to let you know that it's, it's a, you're, you'll hear about it from, your, from some of your, your ABC members, if you haven't already, um, and we're trying to come up with some options for council to consider. Okay, and lastly, council liaison roles. Uh, right now, um, I think everyone should have gotten the email from, I think Jim sent it with the kind of the ideas of what we had. The one thing I wanted to talk with, since we're kind of putting these, uh, reorganizing the um, bodies into new buckets, um, the quasi judicial legislative ones don't have a liaison except for HPB. And I was thinking for consistency's sake, nothing, not to, to take something away from Councilmember Grove, but just for consistency's sake to have, we don't need to have necessarily a liaison to those, but a liaisons to the um, advisory boards that can provide guidance from council to the, to the board and then back to council um, would be um, how I see as the liaison roles there. And I think probably with the quasi, with the commissions, let's go with the commissions, probably be more on staff and the mayors to talk with the, the mayor to talk with the uh, chair if there's any kind of communication needed uh, on reporting like, hey, you know, you're kind of veering off of what you're supposed to be doing from what council wants. Does anyone have any comments on that, of that? I mean, the only thing it really affects is HPB and I just don't want you to feel like you're being punished for anything and taking that away, so. Yeah. But am, am I hearing that you'd like to have liaisons to, to all of the Advisories. And I think we do. I went through. They should have all been on there. I mean, we don't have one for the to the CIST, whatever it is, because they meet twice a year and they give us the reporting. The authorities uh, have liaison positions, which is um, um, or will, and then you know, all the advisory ones should have some sort of um, liaison, the, and that it would be expectation for the council member to attend to be in communication with that chair as much as possible, so there's a good communication. Because I think some of them have lost communication. Um, for whatever reason. Yes? Yep. yep. Hi. Congratulations, you got through our long list of, <laughs> of so points. All, all, all your questions are You have answered every single one. I will least. be watching this video back, but yes, you have answered them <laughs> he all. He does is like, I got to go to bed. <laughs> I, yes, thank you, please. <laughs> all right. Uh, we don't need any other further comment or report from the manager or attorney since they did one before, so uh, we're, we're done. 1028.